So, call to order. Um, so, it's August 15th. It's, a G it's our GBOS regular meeting. Um, I will do a couple of boilerplate statements and then we'll get into the meeting. Good with Board of Supervisors, committees and subcommittees, the subject of the Alaska Open Meetings Act, as found in Alaska Statute 44.62.310 and Anchorage Municipal Code 1.25, public meetings. Good Board of Supervisors operates under the Good with Public Meeting Standards of Conduct. Officially call us to order at 7.03 um, and we will do roll call. Uh, my name is Mike Edgington, co-chair and land use supervisor. Brianna Sullivan, co-chair, Parks and Recreation and Cemetery Supervisor. Guy Wade, uh, Fire Department. Jennifer Lingard, uh, Roads and Utility Supervisor. Thank you. And on the phone? Amanda Sassy, Public Safety Supervisor. Thank you. Does anyone have any disclosures? So I kind of do. It's okay. discussed it before, but yep. I'll run it past again. It's a, uh, a little more complicated for this uh, particular agenda. So I am a uh, long-term mm. landlord only in Girdwood, but I have short-term rentals in Anchorage. Uh, well, one that is only for the summer, but nevertheless. Uh, and I have uh, sleeper listings uh, inactive short-term rental listings in Girdwood from times when my long-term tenants have asked me to in order that so that they could get into or out of a lease early. Okay, so um, we're going to go through the, sure. there are six questions we have to answer and they're not yes. well phrased, so okay. I'll do my best. Is the financial or private interest a substantial part of the matter under consideration? Right, and I'm going to say no because I have no active short-term okay. rentals. Is the financial or private interest directly and substantially varied with the outcome of the official action? Yeah, because they don't exist. So. Okay. Does the financial or private interest, is it immediate and known or conjectural and dependent on factors beyond the official action? The answer is no. Right, so to, you'd say it's conjectural rather than immediate. Right. Okay. Is the public, uh, financial or private interest significant monetarily? No. Okay. Is the financial or private interest of a type which is generally possessed by the public at large or a large class of persons to which the member belongs? Yes. Okay. And uh, other factors appropriate appropriate from the presiding officer. So I think based on the answer to those questions, it, while it's disclosable, it's not a significant um, or a substantial public interest, uh, substantial uh, conflict. Okay, so you're free to take part and vote on that item. Any other disclosures? Hi, hi, Mike. This is uh, Kurt Park, and my disclosure uh, is that I'm not actually. Kurt, we're just talking to board members for this. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I just Thank didn't you. want people to get confused that uh, um, that Suzanne was online when I'm using her Teams account. Okay. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank. Um, see, I don't think I actually. I will. I will for the purposes of. I'll hand it over to you because I have one thing that may be a disclosure. I'm not sure. I'll disclose. Oh, okay, Mike, what is your disclosure? Item number 11 is um, a request uh, about a letter of non-objection for the Pond Cafe of Bort Hyatt and my spouse is employed at uh, Alieska Resort or in the spa. Okay, uh, I would rule that that is not a conflict this evening as the liquor license renewals are routine in all over, and especially in Girdwood and at restaurants, not okay. where they work. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You have a chair back. Thank you. Okay, all calls and disclosures. Um, agenda revisions and approval. Here, um, I'd entertain a motion to approve tonight's agenda. I, this is Brianna. I'd like to amend the agenda if that's possible. Okay. Well, let's let's do um, let's do a motion first to approve okay. and then amend. I move to approve the agenda. I'll second. Thank you. Um, Brianna. Uh, I'd like to suggest we move number 16 to old business for the time constraint on the re responses and feedback for the Seward Highway Interchange. Okay, um, this is based on, if I remember correctly, the, although it wasn't clear there was a hard deadline, the request was for feedback by the middle of August. Yes. Okay, uh, do I hear a second? Okay, 
Um, I can't remember if we actually made this change. I know we suggested that this would need a two thirds. Um, this might need a two thirds majority to move things from old to new. I don't think we implemented that, did we, in our rules? No. I don't recall. No. But if it's a split vote, I guess we can pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any discussions on um, on moving item 16 into old business? So it would become item 10B, I guess, or 10A. There's no discussions. Can we uh, do a roll call vote on the amendment? Sorry. Sorry, just on the amendment. Yeah, on the amendment. Okay, yes, uh, yes. Uh, Mike Edgington. Yes. Grandma Sullivan. Yes. Guy Wade. Yes. Jennifer Wingard. Yes. Amanda Sassy. Yes. Passes 5-0. Okay, so we've amended the agenda, or we've amended the proposed agenda to have um, item 16, good with highway interchange in old business. Um, is there any discussion on the agenda? Okay. I'd like to make a motion that we move item 10, that's under old business, into new business. I think that the um, Description of this as uh, a study is one a little inaccurate, but more importantly, the community didn't see any paperwork on this at all until about a week ago. And I think that there that this is more complicated than it might have first seen. I think this is actually well, it's quite clear. It's actually about uh, code compliance, code enforcement, and that's a different thing than study of short term rentals, but also. Um, I have I have issues with something that floated through with the new business as simply short term rental uh, study without the paperwork. So I think this is every bit as problematic as a builder saying that it's a property improvement uh, when and not explaining whether or not they're moving a hot tub or paving over wetlands. We have to have the actual paperwork for what's happening if we're going to make discussions or if we're going to make decisions about something and switch it from new business into old business. Okay, do we hear a second? Make a motion. I'm not hearing a second. Unless Amanda, you? No, nope, I'm not saying anything. Okay, so the amendment fails. Um, we have the agenda as amended in front of us. Uh, any more discussion on that? If not, we'll move to a roll call vote. Sure. Yes. Brianna Sullivan. Yes. Guy Wade. Yes. Jennifer Wingard. Yes. Uh, Amanda Sassy. Yes. Motion passes 4-1. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go through the um, minutes as one item, um, unless anyone would like to separate them into separate items. Uh, they need to be separate. Sorry? Separate. Okay. So um, we'll do July the 18th um, meeting minutes approval. Here a motion. I move to approve July 18th minutes. Thank you, Brianna. There is a second. I'll second. Thank you, Guy. Any discussion? Uh, yeah, there were some questions about exactly what was passed under um, number 13, and I don't want to get into it again, but I'm hoping that Margaret and I can review over the um, recording. And, and so I'm hoping that we could put this off to and um, just to make sure that we're absolutely accurate on what the motion was and what we passed. Can you remind us what item 13 is? Yes, sorry, it is the one about the trails. Okay. Any other comments on that? So is, is that a move to postpone the, yeah. um, postpone till a later meeting, the approval? It is, just, just to make sure we're absolutely accurate. Okay, you're a second on that proposal to postpone the decision on approving those okay. minutes? Yep, okay. I have a question. So, oh. what, what specifically was it? Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there was so much discussion that night that I think it got a little confused what was and wasn't passed. And, and looking over that, this didn't exactly match my memory. But what I'd like to do is just view the uh, uh, review the recording. And then we would vote on this during the next meeting to approve. That would be the intent. Okay. Yeah, we postpone it to the next meeting. Thanks. Are you seconding? Uh, sure, I'll second. Okay. Thank you. Any comments on that? On this? I agree. I think this is, if it doesn't come up 
if it doesn't come up now, it will come up later on exactly what was it's exactly gonna, what it's, was it's gonna so be a thing. I agree. Okay. It should be clarified. Let's make sure we do it exactly. Yep. Okay. Um, so the the motion is to um, postpone the approval of the July 18th meetings until our next meeting. Um, can you do a roll call vote, please? Sure. Pat? Mike Edgington. Yes. Donna Sullivan. Yes. Ty Wade. Yes. Jennifer Wingard. Yes. Amanda Sassy. Yes. Five zero. Thank you. So uh, that will come up on our next agenda. Um, I then take a motion to approve the July 25th MOA GBOS quarterly minutes meetings. I move to approve July 25th. Minute. I'll second. Thank you. Um, any discussion? Okay, I'll do this. I will uh, seek consent. Is there any objection to consent on uh, approving those minutes? Not hearing any objection, those minutes are approved. Um, the July 26th, 2022, um, for the 2023 budget special meeting, um, minutes approval. Entertain a motion to approve those. And a second. I'll second. This is Brianna. Thank you, Brianna. Any discussion? Any discussion? Not hearing anyone any again, I'll uh, seek consent on approving the July the 20, 26th uh, minutes. Not hearing any dissent, they now approve by consent. Okay. Announcements. The public is encouraged to ask questions and provide comment. Please raise your hand either online or in person um, and wait to be acknowledged. To help discussion stay productive, please direct your comments to the board rather than other members of the public and keep your comments focused on the business under discussion. Please be respectful of everyone's opinions. Um, we have some uh, further budget meetings uh, coming up. Uh, the first one was held last month. Um, meeting number two is scheduled for Wednesday, August the 31st at noon. And if needed, we will have a third uh, budget meeting on September the 19th. Uh, we have a GBOS and LUC joint meeting scheduled for Tuesday, August the 30th at 7 p.m. Uh, via Teams. Um, we'll now move on to the agenda proper. Uh, item number one, update on housing develops in Girdwood, including Holton Hills. Um, let's start with the update from the Holton Hills Housing Advisory Committee. I see Sam in the audience. You recognize Sam? Hi, <clears throat> Sam Daniel here, co-chair of the Holton Hills Subcommittee to the Girdwood Board of Supervisors. At our last meeting, we decided to, um, because we have so much fun to have an extra meeting, so we broke into two groups that are meeting between now and our next meeting on the 23rd. <coughs> um, Emma Kramer, my co-chair, is our co-chair, is uh, leading a small group that's going to take the community concerns that she and Betsy Bartell put together last um, <coughs> meeting and review those and try to distill them down into kind of a more concise summary of the areas of concern, whether they or <clears throat> need to be in different buckets, you know, social, health, life, safety, those kinds of things. And then the um, second group, and I'm not really sure who all is, I don't remember right offhand, it was in Emma's group, if she's online, she can certainly speak after I'm done. And then um, the subcommittee of the subcommittee that I was helping with is myself and Nico Rains um, that are on the committee. And then um, Mike Edgington is a private citizen and also Brooks Chandler participated. And it was a very productive discussion about the letter that Brooks was in, in the last packet from Brooks that talked about <clears throat> the need to, um, for amendments to the um, Holton Hills development project. And what we are trying to do is um, to come up with a list of asks for the developer and the land bank that we would then, and we and I think we had a really good meeting. It was really um, insightful and productive, <clears throat> lots of really good idea sharing. I think we can well things down to probably around seven points. And we're gonna, the two committees will come together on the 23rd and we're going to try to distill those down between that meeting and the meeting on the 30th to a point where we will have a recommendation for the Board of Supervisors on um, the actual, what we would, what we've discussed, and we have not agreed as a committee yet, is to actually have a list of the asks 
that we would then share with the Board of Supervisors approval with both the developer and the land bank in advance so that they would have a chance to review those before we actually met in person. And in closing, what I would mention is that we, we did share with both Kami Oshimura and um, Adam, the gentleman from the land bank, yes, um, that there was no need for them to attend. They're welcome to our next two subcommittee meetings that we were, you know, we'd only met twice and it would take us this long to develop um, the talking points that we would like to review with them. And um, what I would share in closing is that I am um, optimistic that we're going to come up with some really good solid proposals that would not place the entire burden on the developer and would be asking the land bank to step up to the plate and make some um, changes that um, where they would be major buy-in on their part uh, to try and address the community's concerns around affordable workforce housing and other issues that are of great importance to the community. Um, so I, I just feel like by early September, we're going to have something really solid to work with and that we'll be able to hopefully with the board's approval, um, meet with the developer and the, um, and the Holton Hills folks and um, meet with the land bank and the Holton Hills folks and see what they're willing or not willing to do. There's no reason for us to be, I think the community has weighed in and there's a great deal of consensus within the community about what needs to change in order for it to be palatable. And it may be unrealistic. It is unrealistic to expect all those changes, but there is um, every reason to believe that we may be able to affect some of those changes. And if we can get good buy-in from the community, the Board of Supervisors, I believe there's every reason to think that we'll be able to get some some changes that will be meaningful for the community in this first phase of development and on from on Alton Hills. So I'm, I'm psyched. I think that things are going well. And I'm really impressed with um, just we have a lot of really well-rounded people with a diverse background and knowledge that have been able to help us. So it's, it's a group effort, but um, I, I really feel emboldened that we may be able to make real headway. That's all I've got unless the board has questions. Thank you. Yeah, any questions? Go ahead. I have a question. No, I appreciate your and the, and the rest of the subcommittee's time on this. So thank you for that. Um, so CY Investments and HLB, these meetings that you have, they were invited or, or, or made aware that these meetings take place, but yes, sir. they just chose. Are they are they privy to the discussions during that? Are the minutes made up? Do they know what? Um, the discussions about? They have access to the same meeting packets and documents that we do. And Connie has as much trouble with meetings and times as I do. So I try to send her a special invite and make sure that she has um, access to the to the documents. But we haven't shared anything with them that has not been presented through Margaret and, the, and been received by the general public nor have we met with them outside of the, um, of the formal meetings. Okay, no, I appreciate that, that. At least they're made aware of and they know they can't attend, so nothing trips you up later on, you know. I'm sure there'll be obstacles, but we're hoping that we can either go around them or over them. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. But, but am I remembering correctly? I thought Adam probably was, he was, at the last meeting, at least virtually. He, he was. They were. They both attended the. I think the at least the last two. And what we told them was that for the meeting on the 28th and 30th, that we appreciated their attendance, but it wasn't necessary unless they just want to be here. What's happening process-wise? Because we're not going to have anything to really present until we meet these next two times and get the support of the board on what we're going to move forward with on that. So we just wanted them, we want them to know that we um, we value their time just as we value all of yours and we want to make good use of it when they do decide to participate. Okay, thanks then. Any other questions from the board or the public? 
But it's good if we don't, because I don't know much else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, sir. Uh, thanks for all the work from or for all the uh, members of that committee. Um, other thing I wanted to just mention in passing about housing is there was uh, the assembly passed um, an ordinance changing the ADU regulations in Girdwood on the 26th, so the day after our last um, BBOS meeting. Uh, it was pretty much what we'd already discussed um, in the past, except for two floor changes. Um, they changed the number of parking spots, number of additional parking spots required from one or two, depending on the number of bedrooms, to just one. Um, and they changed the maximum size from 900 square feet or 75% of the primary to 900 square feet independently of the primary. So they were the two changes that got happened, happened on the floor by assembly members. So that should now be in force. I don't think there's a, I couldn't find the, um, the signed AO. So um, it may not exist in code yet, but I mean, it exists in code. It just isn't written down and available yet, but it should be very shortly. Okay, um, move, over, move on to item number two, legislative report. Uh, let's start with uh, our state representatives uh, or senators and representatives. It's Senator Holland, who's here in person. Should I sit over here? Is that yeah, you can just stand next to the mic or sit next to the mic. Uh, Thank you. And probably my attendance is not necessary tonight, but um, there's a cool board time that I might get out there and catch tonight. I just watch it. I don't do that kind of a thing. Just watch. You're not serving it today. <laughs> but um, I uh, thank you all for uh, having me over here tonight. Uh, you know, about two weeks ago, we had a really cool signing ceremony for Senate Bill 131 at the fire station next door. Uh, the governor was in attendance. Uh, we had Fire Chief Weston there, Senator, I mean, uh, myself, uh, a Representative Shaw and Representative Josephson. It was Senate Bill 131. It was uh, a, a bill I was running through the Senate and the House about uh, adding uh, press <laughs> candidates. Presumptive illnesses for firefighters and uh, and partial impair, uh, permanent partial impairment. It was a great ceremony, well attended. We had fire uh, fire uh, firefighters from across uh, central Alaska in attendance. And uh, besides that, I tell you, um, with uh, the elections tomorrow, that's probably just uh, sucking up a lot of the atmosphere. I was in the office at the LO today, taking care of some non-campaign stuff. So there is other things going on, but. Uh, I do look forward to getting that election out of the way tomorrow. So uh, that's about all I have for right now. If anybody's got any questions. Any questions from the board? The public? Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Coming thank you. down. Is there, a, um, is there anyone from uh, Representative uh, Kaufman's office on? If not, we will move on to assembly members. Um, so Randy Salt, I see, is online, and I think Kurt is there for Suzanne. Would one of you like to start? I'll let Randy go first. Oh, thanks, Kurt. Appreciate it. Um, Thank you. So I apologize for not being there. I'm actually on the North Slope at the moment. Um, <clears throat> so I'll go through my list here. So first, uh, just a couple of things of my, uh, that I've noted. One, we saw the issue with the Anchorage Health Department Director um, falsifying his resume. So uh, certainly no one's happy about this. I know the administration and the assembly are both looking into it and I guarantee coming out of this we will have uh, more diligent vetting um, by both sides. Um, so definitely an embarrassment for, for all of us. Um, for AO 2022-60, the removal of an elected official, there was a referendum delivered, um, so I, I'm still trying to get the timeline for that. Um, that's still being vetted. Um, ARPA funds, we talked about that briefly. Uh, so for Girdwood, a couple things that have come through. One, there was funding provided for rewriting the Girdwood area plan, and there was also funding provided to Little Bears. And then also maybe of interest is a million dollars to park and wreck for beetle kill, and that'll only be on municipal land. Uh, Ken Miller will be the point of contact for grantees. He's going to reach out in the coming weeks to hold workshops for the grantees. 
to lay out the grant agreement and compliance requirements. So um, that's out there. There's also um, a web page out there for the ARPA funds that goes through the COVID relief, the 2021 funds and the 2022 funds. If you want to see that list of what has been approved. Make sure I get all these. Uh, the next one, um, busing. So you might have heard from ASD that they are in need of bus drivers. I believe school starts this Thursday. The last plan I heard was to break everything into thirds. You would have service for three weeks and then you would not have service for six weeks. Um, obviously, I think Girdwood's a bit of a special case, so I have not confirmed whether Girdwood falls into that category or will have busing the whole time. But it's really a need for CDL drivers. And um, enough said, I, I, hopefully there's someone here from ASD that will talk more about that. But if you know anyone that has in the past um, and is capable of driving a bus, it'd be great if they could help out, even if in during the short term. Um, let's see, on August 26th at 2 p.m., we will have a work session on AO 2022-75, which follows, I believe, House Bill 411 which is um, around tax relief, raising the tax exemption from 50,000 to 75,000. So still need to gather all the rules around that, around which, which, um, which communities will be helped by that. Um, I know Mike's been a great resource for that so far. Uh, on Holton Hills, I just wanna say that I'm, I'm really pleased with how Girdwood has come together with the subcommittee. It sounds like you guys are doing great work. Uh, starting to engage Heritage Land Bank as a single voice uh, and um, engaging CY and really want to see, you know, in, in my opinion, a better deal or another deal come out of this that really addresses Girdwood's needs, which is one of Heritage Land, Land Bank's missions. So again, just great, great job. Hats off to everyone for doing that. Um, I think that's probably the big ones. Uh, what's coming up? Uh, August 17th, Committee on Housing and Homeless. Uh, we have a budget and finance meeting on August 18th. Uh, regular assembly meeting, of course, the 23rd. And let's see what else would be of interest. Um, and then, of course, the ballot proposition, AO 2022-75 that I just mentioned. And that's really kind of the highlights, I guess. Is uh, Kurt anything you want to add before we go to questions? I guess. Uh, let me get my camera to work. <laughs> okay, I think I, I think I, it is now. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, thanks, Randy. You you yep. covered a lot of the items that Suzanne had on her list to share, and and uh, Mondays are uh scouting nights for suzanne she's got kids in boy scouts and she's a scout leader so she was going to try to catch uh up with you guys if she can after the meeting but the, oftentimes they run late so i'm here to listen in and share her notes for her so as randy mentioned he talked about the um uh, health director situation and and certainly that's a big issue that we make sure that the assembly uh, uh, votes for people who are qualified and that there's a adequate vetting being done. Uh, this particular uh, person, the situation last year when it was brought before the assembly, uh, there were a lot of uh, emails and allegations that came up at the last minute and Suzanne just didn't feel comfortable enough um, and hadn't done her due diligence uh, to, to, to be comfortable voting for for this person, for Mr. Grace. And so she was one of the three assembly members who voted no on his confirmation. Uh, but hopefully we'll we'll get past this and, uh, and the administration will have a, a way of really vetting uh, people in the future so we get good qualified people, which is what everybody wants. Uh, Randy mentioned the ARPA funds, a couple other things in addition to the Girdwood and the Little Bears of funding that's of, of interest. There, there was money, 3.4 million for guest house purchase for permanent support of uh, workforce housing for homeless uh, people and 11.9 to the Rasmussen uh, for hotel conversions. And uh, the hotel conversions are uh, really an important part of the community's plan for addressing homelessness because uh, shelter, emergency shelter is costly 
as opposed to housing and uh, the federal government can provide vouchers to assist in the housing costs and, and hopefully people will be able to pay their rent and and uh, not be homeless anymore. So that's why that's an important component in addition to the emergency shelter. And on that point, Randy mentioned that the Committee on Housing and Homelessness is meeting on Wednesday from 11 to 1 at LUSAC and of particular interest is that the uh, municipality, the administration is bringing forward uh, their plan for emergency sheltering. And so that'll be of interest, I think, to everybody. Uh, as people may know that when the temperature reaches 45 degrees, the municipality is required to provide emergency shelter. And so we're approaching 45 degrees, you know, probably within the next month. So um, it's gonna be interesting to see how uh, we can take care of folks uh, when it gets cold. Uh, and that's it for me. And um, I'll be happy to take uh, questions back to Suzanne if I can't answer them myself, and I'm sure Randy can answer them. Yep, thanks, Kurt. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Amanda, anything from you? Nope. I have two quick questions. Um, I'm not sure if either of you are able to answer these. Um, the first one was, uh, there's a period of time, I think it's a week, isn't it, where the mayor can veto um, an ordinance. Is there any indication that may happen for the ARPA funding, for some or all of it? I have, I have not seen any indication that that would, I, I would be shocked if he did that, quite frankly. Okay. So when is no the deadline? Indication. Is that tomorrow? Is that one week or is it longer? I don't recall. It, it's tomorrow. coming up soon. Um, and let you know it let's hope he doesn't uh, veto it um uh he may but the uh i think the votes are there to override the veto okay uh, and my second question was um there's been some discussion in the background about possible change of ownership to i think birchwood airport and potentially in the future girdwood airport have either of you got an update on where that stands or they're transferring from state to municipality. You, you know, I should know that and I can because I'm, I'm a pilot and I part of Lakehood Association I, and I've seen um, emails about this, but I, I can't recollect it from the top of my head. So let me do some research and I'll get back to you on that, Mike. OK, thank you. Um, I, and, I, uh, I would just add quickly the I used to be the uh, deputy commissioner of DOT and the airports was under my purview, and I know that the state is anxious to have any municipality to take over airports if they want them. So I don't know anything about this one particularly, but uh, there is that kind of mindset. Just so I guess it's, it's just a question of time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I recognize um, Betsy who wants to hand up. Say that as of this afternoon, um, South buses have been reinstated for the morning and the afternoon, and um, Girdwood School will then be able to use that afternoon bus. For the morning, Girdwood School is uh, on that three, three, the third rotation. So that's new information as of today. That's great. Appreciate Thank that. Thank you, Betsy. I think we have um, Andy, who's a school board member member uh, coming up next, so hopefully you can give us some more details. Uh, any other questions? I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much, Randy, and thank you very much, uh, Kurt. Yeah, thank Pre you. Yeah, and it, w one more real quick thing. Uh, again, hats yeah, off sure. to Girdwood. Your effort around Little Bears made it possible, so you guys definitely get the credit for, for carrying that through, so thank you again. And I should say thank you for the amendment as well, leading the amendment to uh, release 100,000 upfront as well for free development work. I just want to second my thanks to both uh, Randy and uh, Suzanne for uh, working with us on that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. That, that was Crystal Hope. Thank you. Um, OK, um, actually, we have Mayor's Office next. Is anyone from Mayor's Office there? OK, if not, we'll go straight to uh, Anchorage School Board. Uh, Andy, are you with us? I think I saw you earlier. I am. Thank you. Hello. Um, Question yes, of the day is obviously going to be busing. <laughs> please, please go ahead. Yes, as just reported, uh, and, and this change today, um, Girdwood High School students will continue to get service as usual 
and it will not be a part of the rotation. It, it will continue. And, and I, I want to start out by saying this is a very dynamic situation. Um, I've realized from a lot of social media posts that a lot of people have looked at it and said, wow, this is how it's going to be this year. Uh, they expected a shortage. It was much worse than they thought, and they are working this really hard. Um, so we we hope that there will not be a shortage at some point in the year, and the goal is to make that point happen as soon as possible. Um, the service to the high school students does put the bus in Girdwood in the afternoon. So um, again, outside of the rotation, Girdwood students will have afternoon bus service home. Uh, and I, I haven't seen it specifically, um, but I assume the morning service is part of the rotation still. Uh, but it, it is changing several times a day. So, uh, but I feel quite certain they won't revoke that. Uh, they just recognize that it really put a huge imposition on a lot of families to have to drive that distance back and forth. And uh, none of us wants to see something tragic happen on the highway in connection with that. Um, any questions about the transportation in particular? If not, uh, touching back to the last meeting about capacity of Girdwood School or what would happen if we did uh, have a surge in high school students, um, I did stop by and spend some time with Principal Anderson and there's quite a bit of capacity in the building for uh, pre-K through eight students. Uh, they use all the space right now, but they it's kind of a generous setup. They're able to give rooms to people that are doing programs where in a at capacity school they wouldn't. Uh, but if the number of students grows, they could absorb dozens without really any what we would consider any imposition. Um, and yeah, I think it would be almost seamless as as they got quite a bit of room there. Uh, the building was designed to have a wing added if it came to that. Uh, and when the buildings are designed that way, a lot of the design work is done. And of course, adding onto the building is simplified. So that's that's in the offing. And then there is land going towards the uh, gravel pit that's owned by ASD. Uh, if if substantial expansion ever happened. The other side of this coin is that ASD will actually be looking at shrinking the district uh, this year, and that's that's going to take all the air out of the room. Um, but I, I don't think we need to add anything. If we do get an uptick in the number of high school students, we, we would add sufficient buses to be able to move them to south and back. Um, and there's the added question that if there were a number of high schools, you know, more high school students, a lot of them might want to go to a large comprehensive high school with all the programs. They they may not want to stay in Girdwood for their high school experience, but that's, they're, they're just a whole lot of unknowns right now. So there's not a specific plan for Girdwood. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen with the development. So it's a wait and see, but there is capacity there um, as the district moves down the road. Questions? I, there is a hand. I Thank you. Yeah. It. Yes. Michelle or Chief Weston, depending on your role. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, and I'm just next door. Sorry, I'm in the fire station, but I wanted to say thank you for recognizing the uh, safety concerns on the highway. Anytime we have large amounts of kids on the highway, we want to move them in the safest way possible. And so thank you to school district for reinstating at least part of the bus system. And we look forward to hopefully seeing another solution because my understanding is there's also kids in uh, the other Turnigan Arm <laughs> communities, uh, not just Girdwood, that are relying on the bus system. So thank you. All right. Um, yeah, the the school buses aren't the most comfortable things in the world, but they are really safe. They, <laughs> they're built strong. Um, you know, I, I think this is just part of the combing through the efficiencies that can be gained. Um, it, there is there are emails going out to uh, school families this evening, I think, with details and and things will keep evolving. So yeah. any other questions? Any other questions from the board? Other members of the audience? I don't see any. Uh, unless you had an additional question, Michelle, or was that from earlier? 
Okay. Sorry, that's, it's from earlier. I'm having I'm on my phone, so I'm having some problems. Thank you. Getting my <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Holliman. So uh, thank you we much. Will, thank you. Um, we will now move on to item number three: supervisor reports. Uh, does anybody have a supervisor report to give? I could quickly give one. This is Please Brianna. Thank you, Mike. Um, for Parks and Recreation, for following the last, well, right before the last Trails Committee meeting or right around it, uh, I was able to listen in on a meeting with Craig Lyon, the Planning Director, Kyle Kelly, and Elizabeth Appleby, who's the Senior Planner, and well, especially Dave Whitfield, who organized it, the Planning Manager, following our question about the necessity of the Trails Master Plan. And uh, after a pretty brief meeting, but they wanted to ask how detailed the trails plan was. Um, and they hadn't seen it yet, but they said that the level of the plan needs would still need UDC approval for new trail development. And some zoning districts in Girdwood would require a master plan before approval. So the trails master plan would meet that requirement. And Chapter 3, Title 21 may still apply. Uh, they're very receptive to any other questions or following up and really helpful. So, and then the next special meeting is Monday the 22nd for the Trails Committee. And the last meeting, two amendments were um, worked through and then they'll keep taking away at the amendment. That's all I have. Do they have any feedback about the uh, level of detail that the Trails Committee is going through? Like, is there a sense that the Trails Committee is on the right track with the level of detail? I could ask Kyle to answer. But yeah, so um, the plan is, represent, is recognized as a conceptual plan. Um, just because each trail project, uh, for the level of detail they want, it would take forever to create a plan because it's down to the point where you have to like flag the trail and do things like that. So the ideas that we've received and put into the plan are conceptual. And then they, as we go into those projects, we will need to go through and get all those details out. So um, they, they, uh, they recognize that and they said that that's uh, be pretty common in planning documents that you have conceptual plan. And then when you get into it, you go into a more what that probably does drive us towards is UDC review for probably each trail project. Um, one question I did have a follow up later on was like, could we combine if we wanted to do, say, a summary, we wanted to do several trail projects that's within the plan. We wanted to do two, like two. Could we submit two of those at a time to UDC so we didn't have to pay application fee for each one? And he said yes. So um, especially if they're in the plan, but. Uh, there is a clause within code that allows for them to, for the director to have exemptions and they won't go to UDC, but for the most part, I think most of our trail projects will go to UDC for review um, uh, going forward. So anything new, like for example, the point right in front of us is probably the suspension bridge. They'll have a UDC review. Even though it's an existing trail and it's an existing crossing, we're putting in a new apparatus for crossing that will prior UDC review. Follow up question. Yeah, and I see Amanda also has a hand up. Do you, actually, can I go to Amanda sure. first? Amanda? Uh, no, mine's just uh, raising my hand so I can give report. Oh, okay, sorry. Please go ahead. So just a quick follow up. So your sense is, is not, I've, I've heard some feedback from the community that maybe, maybe possibly the trails committee is getting into too much depth and that's what's creating some of the uh, sluggishness. I don't know the better word for it. So, uh, do you have any, do, is that, do you have any sense about whether or not that's accurate? I guess I would have to know what the context of what somebody thinks is too much depth. Okay. So, you know, it, it, there are some amendments in there that get into grammar in the plan, but the person felt that they needed to do that amendment in order to live with the plan, which could simply be, you know, changing an ES to a, a ES, you know, something like that. That may be pretty detailed, but I don't think it changes the overall context of the plan. That aspect. So, so I have a question as well. I'm not sure who, who to direct this to, so I'll just shout it out. Hopefully, someone can answer. 
Um, when we started this plan, the whole purpose of the plan was to take it away from UDC, which is a, an appointed commission. I don't think there's anyone from this community on UDC that I'm aware of, um, who would be a decision-making process and, uh, and try and sort of effectively take more responsibility for the strategic direction and not have to go through this additional UDC process. So that was the whole purpose of doing the plan in the first place and funding it and doing it initially relatively quickly. Are you, what I'm hearing is that is no longer, either was never the case or is no longer the case. I think it's no longer the case. We have a change in directors. We had a director who maybe felt more comfortable with the plan that had conceptual aspect to it, but we have a director in leadership now that does not feel as comfortable with that direction. And so um, they will look at everything on a case by case and they'll look at what's written in the plan and also uh, Maybe refer to our management plan, which has not been adopted, um, but Charlie should be, okay. um, and look at every case that comes in and make a determination. But they've seen now maybe the controversy of or the <coughs> the lively debate of this whole plan within the community, and so um, I think our director uh, will make a evaluation each time as to do they feel comfortable making that decision to exempt BDC out and move forward on each of these plans. The driver of this plan was the mountain bike area. Yeah. Because the mountain bike area wanted to, um, you know, uh, move forward with development trails and hopefully avoid the UDC fee of $4,000 to get their plan reviewed. But as we've gotten further into that, that's developed even more on its own in the sense that the mountain bike needs a plan that recognizes their area. Um, but the mountain bike is not prepared to submit into the plan their full master plan because they don't know how it's going to work. Like it would, with a mountain bike development is you build one trail, you see how that works, and then how can you tie into it with another trail? Instead of getting up there right now and saying this is the way it's going to be, that doesn't make sense until you get on the ground and you actually start building the trail and see how the flow works and all that type of thing. So. So it, it's a it's a very difficult thing to put into writing without going out there and actually building or surveying each aspect and corner of the trail to know what you're going to do. Which if we did that, it could take us ten years to get anything done. So so at this point in time, you know, planning I think is being conservative. They don't know exactly what they're going to get in the plan that comes out. So they're just preparing us that there could be harsh news or hard and bad news that you're going to have to go through a UDC process as you move forward on developing the trails. Okay, um, and uh, quick follow up is I think um, Danny you mentioned about it being potentially in different zoning areas. There may be a different requirement. Uh, that is what Elizabeth Appleby seemed to be the okay. note keeper as far as knowing the little details and she chimed in with the zoning code and I have this code number 21-03-190. And the master plan um, would it requires a master plan that the trails master plan would be sufficient for uh, okay something like that. But personally, I was glad to hear that if a plan or a process meets the confidence of the director, it can be exempt from UDC. But there's a planning manager, and then there's a planning director. Yep. And then um, senior planners seem to be pretty particular. So like three people that are weighing in on the trail plan we have seen yet. Yeah, and you know, a lot of this is really, uh, this whole process started because of a mountain bike trail that was built in Russian Jack Park. Right. There's a lot of controversy with the neighborhood and they never did UDC repasses before to review trails. Mm -hmm. So within the last four years, this is this has been kicked into gear that UDC is a review process and I think that's where planning has just gone now to by default. So, so, they, but they also said you need to have a plan that shows what the community wants so we understand what's coming out of the community. So, if it's written in there conceptually, we know the community wants that. Now, show us the details of what this plan is going to look like. Right. I think I understand. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, sorry. I, I did have to, but I think you just answered it. That so they, so there is a purpose for this plan. They said that it is. Not required, but it, it was beneficial. I said it was a huge asset to go through all of this legwork. Yeah, they looked through the plan. They they were pretty impressed with what the communities produced with the community led document, even though there was 
a consultant on it. The community really led the charge on what's in there and still going through what's developing that plan. So, so they uh, they did give kudos to the community for what they've done. It was definitely worth finishing when we started, right? Well, I said yes. I, yeah, I'm in the thick of it. That's probably a different discussion, but yes. So what I'm hearing is that is the um, is that if we did not have a plan, it would almost certainly have to go through UTC process. Now there's maybe an option. Correct, and you know, and it also gives us the direction on what we're going to work on. Yeah. So we're not going in circles as to what we're going to do each year. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll move on to Amanda. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention um, there was a an article in the Anchorage Daily, I believe, um, about uh, naloxone or Narcan use um, in Anchorage Police Department that um, Mike kindly brought to my attention and followed up with the Whittier Fire or Whittier Police and found out that they do carry um, naloxone in their cars and that all of the officers are trained to use it. Um, they have not had one incident where they needed to use it um, and they felt that uh, for the most part uh, fire department is really close by unless they are transporting somebody um, to town and then that's when it's most likely going to be really necessary um, but they do have it in case you need it so just wanted to update the community thank you thank you um Anybody else? OK, we will move on to service area reports or service provider reports. Uh, let's start with fire department. Uh, Chief Weston, you have five minutes. Well, hi there. Um, I'll just I'll be there in person. Hold on. OK, in that case, we'll move on to police. Uh, I'll talk for them. Uh, uh, Chief Ashe is just returning part time at the current time. He's been on medical. Um, and so uh, Lieutenant. <laughs> Joe Coburn, uh, I talked to him today, but he is unfortunately cannot attend tonight due to a personal issue. But um, they've been pretty steady with business, and uh, um, they have all officers back except one who's been out maternity leave with his wife. So uh, they should be returning soon. But they have all officers hired, and the chief returning back to full time, the full staff, which um, is great because they've had. Many tough years with recruiting, but now they have a great slate of officers that work. Okay. Do you know if any of the officers have CDLs? <laughs> <laughs> they drive the ambulance when they do so. <laughs> okay, um, Chief Weston. Sorry, sorry please. Really, sorry. Question no, from super quick. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, I have, have I've been missing. Are we not getting the reports that we used to be getting? Of We've been backlogged on those with the chief being on medical lead. We'll ask him to, once he gets back full time, to catch up on those. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Any other questions? No, now we'll move on to fire. Uh, Michelle Austin, fire chief. Um, Could you come up to the microphone just to? Uh, we've had uh, 311 calls so far this year. Um, right now, we have an open house for anybody who would like to be a firefighter, Sam. <laughs> Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow night um, at uh, seven o'clock, uh, come by. We'll also give you a uh, pizza for dinner uh, and you can well, for an hour learn about uh, how to become a firefighter. Um, we had one, uh, another uh, open house uh, two weeks ago. Weird like this way. Uh, we had the open house two weeks ago um, and we had four people interested. So, um, you know, it's a slow type of thing, but uh, people are slowly coming in uh, to be interested in the fire department. We can take eight at a time and eight will start in October. Um, our firefighter one class is finishing up. We're probably going to, we've had a lot of attrition going on, so we'll probably have about five members testing for firefighter one. That's interior firefighting. Um, we've been very busy. Uh, we went over to Whittier twice uh, in the last couple of weeks, uh, once for the boat fire and then additionally for a MVA, which was a, a vehicle that launched off down into the creek. Um, Whittier is short staffed right now. They're also looking at hiring additional firefighters and possibly a fire chief um, as well. Uh, to, uh, the, uh, as uh, uh, Kyle mentioned, uh, Whittier police officers are driving the ambulance uh, right now, oftentimes on calls. Uh, so 
Um, that should be something we should be aware of. I'm really glad they're having additional staffing because when they're driving the ambulance, obviously they're not doing the police work. So, um, you know, it's something we should be aware of as a neighboring uh, service entity. Um, along with that, uh, our firefighters are uh, starting to go around and visit every commercial, uh, not a uh, multifamily and public occupancy um, ar around town. Uh, we were at Gerber School today. Uh, we'll be at the, ch at the chapel and Gerber Clinic tomorrow. Uh, we've gone out to Portage and done the Portage Visitor Center, their bunkhouse, and then the Wildlife Center. Uh, and so uh, you might get a phone call from me asking for us to come over. It's really important that we come over and walk through the buildings so we kind of understand where everything are. And then super, super kudos out to the school. Um, we're, they're going to call us when they have their ALICE drill or active threat drill uh, later on uh, in the next month or so. Uh, and then um, we're also going to work on going over there and having lunch with the kids maybe once a week. So. Um, and that's it. Any questions for me? Any questions from the board? I've got one very quick question. The um, I believe the Anchorage Fire Department recruiting period has just opened. Yes. Oh, we, uh, I know yes. in the past we've been very successful in getting people yes, from Gerber to Anchorage. Yes, we love when Anchorage Fire Department is recruiting. Uh, they are actively recruiting, uh, both calling up command staff, asking them to work there, and also um, trying to recruit away. Also, uh, Chudiak is also hiring for chiefs as well. Um, and Whittier. So there's a lot of demand for firefighters right now. Um, all a lot of departments are actually hiring, but you know, Anchorage is a it's a good bad news threat thing. Um, as we lose people to Anchorage, then we it's we'll use lose oftentimes the most experienced people. So I mean, that's a threat. But you know, great career. Can't say nothing things about A and So is the expectation that we will there will be a few people moving to Anch moving on to Anchorage? Uh, we usually have about 12 people test. Um, and sometimes about five get in. Um, it, it all just depends on how the testing process goes. Sometimes this last time nobody got in, so it just depends on the process. Okay, thank you. So, but AMD is going through a large retirement. Like 20 years ago, we saw a big retirement, and they're going through that same now 20 year wave of retirement. So that's that's impacting things as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so let's move on to uh, roads and parks and rec. Kyle. Sure. Um, first off, we want to say thank you to uh, Bob Mocha. He's been an outstanding help this summer seasonally. Um, he's received a full-time position, which he is moving on to. Um, and so we appreciate having him here for the summer. Uh, that means we are no longer have any seasonal staff. So Margaret and I will be picking up the workload um that we can with uh, what our seasonal caretakers would take care of usually till the end of september um so we'll be uh, uh taking that over this week and they also want to give big thanks to john gallup he was huge uh, we spent two and a half days uh, him and i in the skate park last week working on rebuilding or building a new ramp in there um so there's a new eight footer in there that replaces a six footer uh, we're just waiting on the skate like screws that show up and we'll get the final touches on that ramp uh, this week um and complete there so um, and then we have a final woodlot of the year, which is Saturday, August 20th, and that will be from 10 a.m. to noon and then 1230 to 4 p.m. We may run one in September if we have staffing. Uh, the fire department has been a great support with that. Um, and uh, also the wildlife center uh, taking a lot of the brush that they can use to feed their animals. So uh, those are some major things coming up there. Um, just uh, quickly touching on with parks, uh, we are trying to work through some projects. We did, we're able to secure a crew through Alaska Trails. They're gonna come up there in September and help us finish work on the Virgin Creek Falls Trail, um, uh, bringing in more uh, gravel to the trail. Uh, we've seen good success up there with that and uh, improving the treads so that we can keep people on one path and then out of there. And then we have, I have reached out to the uh, traffic department to help us start looking at permit signage at the top of that road or no parking, um, and then also seeing whatever options we can do on Timberline to help with speed control um, that uh, traffic uh, traffic department will allow us to do with traffic engineers. So we're hoping to have them down for a visit on site uh, in the coming weeks uh, and take a look at the area there. So um, switching in the roads, uh, boy, it's been wet. So um, and it's been hard for us to get any work done because we're afraid to put the grader out there, break the capital what we have on the roads and then turn everything to mush um, but it looks like we have a window coming up maybe towards this weekend 
And uh, right now we have a grader scheduled for Thursday to get out dealing with all the rough roads and try to get those healed up. Um, but we can just get some dry conditions for at least two days that would help us a lot uh, in that aspect. So we're waiting for that as well. Uh, we are waiting on one permit to work on the replacement of a cross culvert at Vail. This new culvert will be uh, fish uh, passage standards. I'll meet the fish passage standards. And, um, and then following that project, we'll work on several other drainage projects um, that are, uh, we'd like to get done here uh, in that aspect. Uh, we ordered uh, the e-chips, or actually put a bid out for the e-chips with 6% uh, salt for the winter. It's our, it's our sanding chip. Um, and uh, the winning bid came back at 45,000 um, from Northern Gravel. Uh, that is about uh, 9,000 more than it was last year. Um, but the second bid after that was 72,000. So uh, we were happy to get that bid and the bids went as high as 127,000. Um, and that's for 1,200 tons of e-chips. So uh, that should be lit, delivered uh, late September, early October, um, and we'll start stockpiling that and get that ready for the year. Uh, so, um, and then major projects, uh, we are pretty much all, we are all done with the Halloween weekend storms, so the Halloween storm last year, and the damage there. Uh, we're now working through reimbursement from the state um, and getting that all put back together. Um, and then also the contractor uh, is working on that. We did finally negotiate a fuel variance with the contractor um, and our base rate will be based on January um, 1st, 2020. And, uh, and then the, the variance will be what the price was from there to what it is now. Prices are starting to go back down, but um, and then the fuel variance will only apply to invoices from March 22 uh, forward. So basically, uh, going back. So uh, we worked that out with purchasing um, and the contractor has agreed to it and we're moving that forward and getting that, that completed. So we'll start to see fuel variants that show up on our invoices. So there'll be a separate line showing what the variance was uh, for the different pieces of equipment um, out there. So, and then um, budget wise, we've uh, spent 402,000 of the 700,000. Uh, we have a few more summer projects and then we'll save the rest for uh, early late fall, early winter maintenance uh, for snow removal and uh, ice control uh, moving forward. So we're, we're right on pace with our budgets or should be at this point in time. And in um, Parks and Rec, same thing. Uh, we'll actually have a little bit of a surplus because of the lack of staffing this year. So I'll probably talk with the board about using some of those funds to probably put into a larger capital contribution. Um, so that's we won't be not using them for operation uh, in that aspect. Uh, but we are taking on some other projects and one thing that we'll probably do in the fall is a bit of more tree mitigation um, with the extra budget money uh, we have a several trees that probably need to be dealt with and we'll wait till the leaves get down we talked with our our tree contractor and they said it's probably best to wait till late september october and uh, attack those trees then so uh, in that aspect and uh, all the other budgets police and fire are right where they need to be for this time of year so everything looks to be on pace I just have a question out of curiosity. I mean, we're probably having a pretty, the first big high water event since um, the culvert washed, uh, washed out on the way to the dump. Have, have you noticed any, uh, are, are the new culverts holding up? And yeah, I've been down there several times during this, this rain cycle and uh, the watching when they're doing great. Um, the, what's really nice is the outflow is a lot, is a lot more controlled this, now, this time. Um, they embedded the bank and the base of the outflow with large riprap, so when it comes out, it no longer uh, turns up. It used to kind of almost shoot up like a rocket, um, so it does really well. And then the armoring that they did on the inlet side, uh, just is, you can just see how much stronger it was. You know, that, that was an issue before, is there wasn't very good armoring, and that's what eroded uh, the coal, you know, eroded the road out and exposed the weakness. So the armoring looks a lot stronger. But, you know, the thing about it is that those culverts are temporary and the, the permit replacement um, would be a lot, a lot bigger. Um, you, you, whereas down there watching the fish patches come through there and the fish still have a very hard time getting through there because of the velocity of the water going through that section. And so you can see that they're working their way through, but it's not as with as much ease. So, so yeah. Thanks. Kyle, could you also, uh, I assume that when you have a small window like this for road maintenance, that you must have a list of prioritized 
I'm just curious, like kind of basically what's in the worst shape? Well, Timberline Vale. That's what I said. Uh, <laughs> you know, that corner there, because everybody's turning and powering there. Yeah. Um, and then uh, there are definitely other sections of Timberline. Uh, there's been a lot of construction down off Alpena and Barron and, and Tanner. Um, so we're seeing it pretty bad through there. We're seeing sections to the airport there are bad on uh, that aspect. But, you know, one thing that we did notice is that a lot of the crowning work that we have compared to years past is actually holding up. Uh, Vail between Loveland and Stowe can be really bad or up to, and that area has held really well. So um, we've had a significant amount of inches of rain in the last 20 days. And, and so sections are holding up. And I think it's just because we've had a good qualified grader operator who can cut below those holes and then relay it. And then we run the nine wheel over them now instead of the compactor. And that nine wheel is, is producing better results than compared to what we ran a steel drum compactor. So, so yeah, well, I think those are the areas. Uh, we will definitely deal with the collectors. The side roads seem to be holding fairly well. Um, so the collector roads like Vale, Timberline, um, you know, uh, Alley Escovue, Mount Hood, those type of areas, we'll, we'll be definitely trying to get as much done as we can within the eight hour period that we have and see if we can come back the next day. Okay, anybody else? I have a question. Kyle, I'm really glad to hear about the purchasing and the contractor working out the fuel variances. And I guess my question would be, and you did say moving forward from March, but does anything need to be written into the agreement or is it going to be okay for variance? Oh, no, this will be an amendment to the contract. So they, he, he's signed an amendment to the contract, which then becomes in that fuel variance is only in place until uh, it's craziest date, December 14th, 2022. So, which drives the counting nuts. So they're like, <laughs> I couldn't just be like the first or the 30th, but that's what the purchasing director wanted on December 14th, which is actually a Sunday, so. Okay, thank you. Um, the fund, I think there was some discussion about potential funding sources for the culvert replacement on Ryan. Do we have any more information on that? So what we've heard is that Lisa Rakowski within her appropriation bill has put 1.6 million towards it. We, we're, we're seeking 2 million. So um, it is dependent on passage of the, um, basically the budget uh, for the federal government, um, which we won't know until December, um, most likely. And so uh, what we're hearing from her staff is that they're very confident about this 1.6 million. Um, the thing that we were really worried about is that when we get appropriations from the federal government, they usually go to the state and then the state uh, DOT then runs the project like we saw in Town Square and Olympic Mountain Loop, which was a huge suck of money um, and was very inefficient. But we've heard that uh, this is going to be a direct appropriation to the municipality, so it'll come to us to manage and we'll cut out the state um, from getting involved because usually when you have the state involved, the project becomes twice as much because of their overhead and the way they run operations compared to the way before. So, okay. Um, and that would be in time for bidding during the winter and? Uh, we would hope so. Okay. It just depends. We'll have to do RFP to bring on design team and um, and then and then do those steps. So we'll see what happens. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, no more questions I see. So we'll move on to public comment. Persons offering much public comment must state the full name and address. Public comments limited to three minutes per person must be on subjects not listed on the agenda. Does anyone want to make a public comment? Seeing anyone in the room? I'm not seeing any hands online. Okay, we will move on to old business. Uh, item number five, discuss the 2023 GVSA budget information. So uh, in the packet tonight, we just uh, included the budgets that we are uh, have been proposed to GBOS and will be um, much larger discussion and work session because these could this could just easily take an hour to hour and a half alone. I think our last meeting was two hours directly on the budgets, um, but boy, just to share a few things um, and where we stand um, right now. So uh, the municipality works on a mill system and uh, uh, so Gerwood is is. Uh, um, under that mill system, and so for Gerwood, we have a mill cap of 6.0, and right now our current mill is 4.92, um, which is the lowest it's been in quite a while. Um, it has a lot to do with our assessments going up so high um, in, in, 
in the Gerwood service area. Um, so that has lowered and created more mill under the cap there. Um, but our total levy is 12.41. Um, and that is for a area that has all essential services, which is police, fire, parks and rec, road maintenance. Um, we're the lowest uh, mill levy in the municipality out of all the tax districts. Um, you can see there, I gave you a comparison to tax district one, which is basically a downtown um, area. And you can see their mill is 16.84 um, in comparison. So um, we are very efficient with what we do here. And so our, uh, our, our mill has, it shows that in the way that is. You can see last year, one was, last year was kind of one off when we think we had to repay the school bond debts because the state didn't do that reimbursement. So that was a, a huge hit to the residents last year uh, as additional 1.09 mills. Um, but uh, we're not seeing that this year because the state didn't make reimbursement for, the, for those payments. So um, so that, that's why you might see that there. And the other point I'll point out is area wide. So uh, this year we actually got a rebate from area wide taxes. So other revenues uh, come in to pay for area wide services. This includes like EMS, the library, um, traffic department, uh, they do our stripe, our striping and signage, um, dog catcher. Um, this year, that was actually negative because they corrected enough revenues in like alcohol, tobacco, rental cars, um, even part of the bed tax, um, and and so that decreased our our mill just a little bit there uh, in that aspect. So so that's just sort of a summary, historic summary. And this this is within the packet too. It uh, just gives you understanding what the mill's been like over time. So. Uh, and then this is just a summary of all the different districts. The only district lower than us is district, I believe, 15, and that's the area in Turnigan Arm and Fire Island and actually our neighbors up at Crow Creek. Uh, all they pay for is school district and a little bit of police um, just as an emergency procedure for major response. Uh, they have a little fund that they collect from them in that aspect. And then I we could get into the details if you like tonight about each individual budget, um, but uh, just to give you a quick summary of what we're looking at this year uh, for the different departments. Um, Fire is requesting a $326,000 increase, uh, mostly associated with labor to help them with recruitment and retention of their uh, firefighters, their paid staff and their volunteer on paid staff over there. Uh, Rhodes is uh, uh, looking at it. Uh, Eighteen thousand uh, dollar increase this year, um, and uh, that once again has to do with staffing numbers um, and, and payroll, um, and also some uh, operational expenses there as well. And then police, uh, at this point in time, we're looking at a eighty-six thousand dollar increase um, that's being uh, worked out with Whittier for renewing the contract. That would be a twelve percent increase, um, but it'd be a one-time increase and they are opened up to a five-year contract, and there would be no CPI increases after that. So that uh, 86,000 would be, we'd spread that over five years for the increase, uh, but we wouldn't see um, uh, a change in that contract rate for the next five years. Um, and then, uh, so total we're looking at right now, a $445,000 increase, which would equivalently be 0.6 mil increase uh, for the year. So, um, so if there's any questions, we could go through each one of these, but I do, we have a work session plan and I just wanted to present the information tonight and keep this on the agenda as we move forward, because we'll be discussing it and hopefully voting on it next month in old business. <clears throat> okay. Um, any questions on the board? Okay. I've got one more for you too. I just want to show you, okay. um, cause you guys probably have not seen this and I just got it. Get to it here. Um, this is our fund balance. And so last year we really hit our fund balance pretty hard um, to help pay for the repairs um, that we're seeking reimbursement from the state last year. But when that storm happened in October, we tightened down our expenses um, and, and uh, really cut out uh, uh, planned work that we had to finish out the year for um, parks and rec and, and, uh, and particularly roads. And we we're able to put funds back in through um, that were that were unspent for operation, and it got our reserves back up to where they need to be. So our reserves now are back 
uh, to the amounts they need to be at. We actually have a undesignated uh, set aside right now of 24,000. So we're starting to save again within this account. So that's good because what we start seeing that money come back from the state, um, which uh, we can probably move towards our capital account and start to build that up uh, for future projects. So, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm not seeing any questions, so we will, oh, actually, we do have the second part of item five, uh, discuss date for GVSA grant application presentations. But, uh, you, Margaret? Well, I think what we want to do is uh, just let you know that we'll be sending out a doodle poll. So if you have dates that you would like to target or avoid, we do have a lot of meeting scheduling. So, um, you know, I just want to get this on the books so that we can let our grantees know that they'd be expected to present on that date. So we'll send out a doodle That's likely to be in September or October. September and October. Okay. I mean, you can do the budget without it. Yeah. So. We can do it a little later, but I think we want to catch people while they're active and thinking about the application that they put into. Yep, understood. Okay, thank you. Um, so moving on to item six, update on status of HLB draft 2022 annual work program and five-year management plan. Uh, so uh, Director Tromley did confirm that they are not going to do a five-year work plan in 22, and they're pushing that to 23. So we will probably see the process uh, start over again in 23, and we'll see what plan they actually put out under new uh, staff. So uh, we'll look for that in 23. They do have a meeting this month, a regular meeting with their advisory commission, um, the last Thursday, I think, of the month. Um, and so they may address that there, but at this point in time, nothing's going to happen in 22 for work plan 20 versus 23. So, so if you're fine, we'll probably remove this from yeah. the agenda. Suggest that it gets removed. Okay, item number seven, unless there's any questions. Item number seven, gender item LUC 2201-06, Goodwood Industrial Park concerns. So at this point in time, we have no update on this. Uh, we will be working with staff as they have time to help us address this situation. Um, and especially the power, we're really gonna push for that in 23 to get completed um, and, and move that forward. We were moving along with that and then everything changed when the change in staff happened. So, and the platting, I don't, even, I don't even think that's on their radar. So we'll see if that shows up in their work plan for 23. Okay, so that's, Please go ahead, uh, Kyle, would it help if any of us, because it, I'm guessing the industrial park is not on the agenda, because I think I saw the agenda for the 28th for HLB meeting, to make a public comment about it? Yeah, I think it's always good to keep it on the radar and discuss it with the, uh, you know, just to bring it up in those meetings. So I know uh, both the designated representative and the representative at large from Gerwood um, on the commission were aware of it and they were trying to help us work through it before the staff changes happened. Okay, any other questions on that item? No? Seeing any from the public. So we will move on to item number eight, uh, update on GBS resolution 2020-11, resolution against racism in the community. Guy. Yeah, thanks. Um, not much yet. I, I, I think I spoke last time. I, I contacted Olivia Frank from the Alaska Humanist Board, Humanities Forum, and I hope to work with her. I've been out pretty much all last month with work and I'm out of town, and um, I believe Ms. Frank gets back middle of next week. So um, definitely hasn't fallen off our radar. I just think, um, yeah, kind of a busy time of year, and, and um, hopefully this fall we can get something put together. That's all I got for now. Okay. Do you, do you think fall is likely? I don't see why not. But. Right. Thank you. Any questions on that? We'll move on to item number nine, update on GBOS resolution for legal opinion regarding Holton Hill uh, HLB process of the RFP for development agreement and the development agreement on Holton Hills. When I last spoke to um, Adam Trombley, it was still on his desk and he had not heard back from legal. Is there an update from that? Correct. Since the last GBOS meeting, we drafted a uh, request for legal opinion and I needed the approval of the HLB director, Adam Trombley, to uh, move that forward to legal and, and 
So I sent that to him and I have not heard anything back. I think the actual process was it ended up on his desk. I don't think we initially thought it had to go to him. No, I thought I, I had to get it by super direct supervisor, but he uh, deflected it because it's not actually within our our, our uh, responsibilities. So he said that he should go to the director of HLB to approve since it's yeah, deals with the department. Which is rather a weird situation. So when I spoke to him last week, um, it, he was still waiting for a feedback from legal. I think the question was whether um, GBOS can even ask this question since it's not one of our powers. Um, the topic we will be discussing soon will be our next meeting. Um, okay, any questions on this? Yeah, just to, just to clarify and make yeah. sure I understood that correctly. So we requested a weak opinion about something that went through Bolton Hill, or sorry, through HLB, and so it has landed now with the director of HLB to yes. decide whether or not our question is legitimate. The qu so what the question was about whether the um, HLB followed <clears throat> followed code and process for the RFP, the awarding of the RFP, and the develop and the generation of the development agreement. And um, the advice we got from the assembly um, attorney, assembly council, was to go through a request for legal legal services. I think legal services, yeah. which is an administrative uh, process within the muni. Uh, Kyle generated that. It went to your director, correct? And then he pushed it on to the real estate director. So it's ended up HLB asking, you know, HLB asking a question about HLB. Um, obviously, that I don't think is satisfactory. Um, but there's still a possibility that um, it may be it may result in a question to legal. If it does not, I think we have to still act on this. Um, so when we get an answer back from um, from legal. We will make a. We'll bring come back to this and discuss if we need to. But it could have we just entered purgatory. It's oh, possible. So we place. should have this. The work well, potentially. We'll have this on the agenda next week, and then we can make a decision on what we do. I just wanted to make sure we were circling back around since we. Yeah, but well, I think it should stay on the agenda. Okay. Actually, can you, was it after our last meeting, or was it after our? The um, joint meeting with LUC, I don't recall. It may have been slightly more. I think I felt it was uh, after the last GBOS. Yeah, meeting, you're probably right. We did that. Yeah. yeah, it's around about a month-ish. So we'll give them a few more, another week or two, and then come back to it next time. Okay. Any other questions on that? Item number ten, agenda item LUC 2206-6. Request for GBOS resolution of support for study of short term rentals in Girdwood to be conducted through MOA planning department. So we have a resolution in the packet. We discussed it at LUC in last month. Right page myself. Draft resolutions okay. at the very end of this topic in uh, yep. the I think the draft resolution is on page 32, and uh, the description of the project is on page 31, and there's several pages beforehand that describe the, um, the software as a service which the, which the planning would have. Okay. I would entertain a motion to um, adopt the resolution. So we can read the resolution in or take it as is. I move to adopt the resolution as is without reading. We hear a second? Yeah, a second. Okay. Any discussion? I do have a question. Sure. Um, so when when is how long will this study take before we get a deliverable? The my understanding is the um, that's probably a detail to be determined precisely, but the delivery data will be available. I think after I think it's a month or two. So I would expect data to be coming in after a month or two, but it's over the course of a year. I 
partly depends on planning's resources when they get to them. So it'll be a year as far as they gather data. For the whole, the whole, the whole study was going to take a year. Yeah, because we have a definitely seasonal things going on here. So as a follow up to that question, can you, can you tell me where that information is? I think it says it's a year's study in the page thirty one. You guys are on a computer, but I'm not. Sorry. So it does not say it's a year yeah. study on page 30. It's been discussed before. That was the um, that was where the money came for the amount came from it for a one year, a one year study. A tiny little editing piece for the fourth, whereas piece one R, extra little S after STR, the end of that first line, fourth, whereas. In the fourth, whereas studies in other resort communities have shown that the housing market is affected by the increased number of STR. What? I think so. It read that be a plural. We'll call that strip in this area. Okay, I'll speak to this briefly. That's okay. So there's been a long uh, a question for a while about how how much how many STRs there are, where they are, um, and definitely if there's going to be any or well, as policies get developed and um, Potentially, you know, regulations get developed, which I know um, Bradley has mentioned he's actively working on at the moment. Um, this data is going to be important to know what impact it's going to have um, and to tune the, um, the regulations to the community. So I would say this has been a long term ask and we have the opportunity to go ahead and do it. And we should do so. Um, I've heard some concerns. I, we definitely heard concerns at LUC about um, the information about whether the information will be available to the public, which is uh, being shared with the municipality. And my understanding is no. Um, the contract is between uh, Granicus, which provides services to the municipality um, and planning. Uh, it's not, these dashboards and other things are not public. Uh, they, require a, uh, they require a sign in and various other legal bits and pieces. Um, so that it's not a public facing dashboard, it's a dashboard only available to um, planning department. Um, and I think there are other concerns that I've heard from other people. Maybe you can, and maybe Jen, you could speak to those as well, if you wish, since rather than me representing what we've discussed. No. If that's okay, if you want to, yeah. <laughs> sure. sure. Um, yeah. I do have a number of concerns about this, but and when talking to other people in the community, particularly uh, some of the people that are involved in short term rentals, this is very concerning. And um, let me let me start with what we have right now from Granicus, and, and this was what was presented at land use. <laughs> Excuse me. This is actually just a copy of a web page on the Granicus site. This is easily accessible even now it is an exact printout of a, a web page that uh, you could tell is uh, dated June 9th 2021. So what it lays out and then what this thing that says Girdwood short-term rental study lays out are two entirely different things. What Granicus and, and this is what land use so I want to be clear on that. Land use did not see this piece of paper that said we're doing short term rental study. We, land use only saw this Granicus thing, which again is not a contract and it's not specified what the city's getting and what's being studied. But if we go with it and pretend that it does, uh, 
it has a number of things that I think would concern anybody, including the uh, giving the city the ability to scroll over addresses and basically peer into every house, every house that has had a short term rental in whatever period of time is covered by this. There's so much that's unclear on this. Uh, Granted, is also uh, let me just say, I, I do have issues with this being called a study because that's not what Granicus does. You spend any time on Granicus website at all. Granicus is not uh, in the business of uh, social or economic research. That's just not what they do. They do code compliance. So what this is, regardless of how we want to label it, what this actually is, is photo radar for STRs. We all remember how Anchorage reacted. So this is this is exactly what that is. It is automatic uh, looking into uh, anyone who you know remember when anyone who dared to drive a car through a uh, <laughs> school area. That was when you know that and Anchorage laid eggs about this. But this is much more intrusive than on a radar. And in particular, this business of having. Uh, the city being able to peer into every bedroom, living room, and kitchen, they can see what's been remodeled, who's added bedrooms, who's done. So if anyone who had issues with their tax assessments this year, who's a short-term rental owner, um, is, is going to hate this for very good reason. It, this is intrusive. Now, when we look at what the studies we want done, how many SDRs are open, how many full-time, I'm all for this, actually. This is not what is listed or described in this Granicus paper or on the website or in it. So I understand if that's what this is, there's a lot here that, that looks good to me. We need to know these things, but we, I feel like we are instead starting with a stick and bludgeoning our short-term rental owners with it. And then when we're going to turn around and try to enact zoning regulations, and zoning changes and whatever limitations we are going to eventually be able to get through, we've now exacerbated our relationship with a significant percentage of our population. So that's what I have, would have to say about that. I think, I think we need to be very clear on what we have, and none of these pieces of paper right now are clear about exactly what we're getting, how long it lasts, are we going to keep Scroll it into people's bedrooms for how long? <laughs> we, uh, and how does how does what Grant has says it does relate to what we think we're getting? And again, I would really encourage everybody to read those two things because they're completely different. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I had two comments. Uh, one quick one, just details in response to the land use packet did actually have the short-term rental study in it oh, included good. last week and then the emails one of them that responded to gbos was mostly referencing non-compliance with short-term rentals but that isn't really something that this study is focusing on right now so i i feel that my support is for the funding that Assemblyman Weddleton put toward uh, the 2022 budget revision, and I will be voting in favor of this. Can, could you just clarify what uh, the email you got? I think all of us received one today, and they that person mentioned non-compliance. I think they're saying like, how would the municipality enforce it? But that I feel like a detail later down the road. I think because I'm not aware. Yeah, I think the point there is that there aren't any short term regulations at all. Short term rental regulations, there is no compliance except for the existing one about paying uh, or registering for room tax or room tax being collected through the platform. Which I presume everyone already follows. Guy, do you have a I just had a question, you know, kind of concerning the, uh, about you know, them looking into our bedrooms, as you put it. Um, I'm assuming they're collecting this data from records, from building records in the Muni code and that, or are they actually going out to individual no, houses? This is, this is um, they're collecting those photos from the photos that the 
um, short term rental owners put on VRBO or Airbnb. That's so, so it's the photos they're putting out onto the public website. So it's a public. Okay. Just to be clear, I think there has been some misunderstanding about what is exactly uh, easily accessible in public and particularly what the experience is like for a short term rental host. Um, the hosts feel very strongly about not having their addresses be public. I can't imagine why anyone would want to know. And then ideally, nobody does know. I mean, ideally, you're part of the neighborhood and you're running it seamlessly as um, a good citizen and the neighborhood is completely unaffected. Now, obviously, <laughs> that's not the case and we've been struggling with some of that. But I'll speak to this idea that this is all public information. Anyway, it's one thing to have a public information sort of it's those addresses are not widely available. You cannot get, you cannot go to Airbnb and see where the addresses are right now. If you could, obviously we wouldn't even need this. You just take the 12,000 and use it for something that's different for Airbnb. So uh, the, this is not currently collated information, but number two, it's not easily accessible. So it's uh, a difference between somebody being able to just say scroll over your name for your voter registration and find out your age and weight and body height and all of this. <laughs> it's maybe that is all available somewhere if you look at it all on the web, but to have that kind of thing be available just by oh, scrolling. Um, so, uh, and I, I'm sorry if I misunderstood. I guess I'm going to tag this piece of paper in the packet. And by the way, Kyle, I think. Um, I'm getting a message that we had somebody waiting in the waiting room. Yeah, I got him. Okay, yep. great. Um, but again, Granicus is very clear that what they do is code compliance. They do data collection from multiple websites for code enforcement and, and um, compliance. And so one of the, my other issues about this is we have seen, we have absolutely no evidence whatsoever that Girdwood SDR owners are not uh, applying or, or not, or somehow or another, not paying their bed taxes or whatever else. In fact, when this has been looked into before, my understanding is that the study was cut short because people are complying because not complying is way more of a hassle, actually, than just going along with having Airbnb and Airbnb. So this code compliance is solving a problem we don't have. And I feel like it's not only is it solving a problem we don't have, but it's going to create problems we don't need in the process by exacerbating an already contentious relationship with uh, SDR owners in town. Whereas I, I really would like to see us work as a community to solve the problems that these are creating before we resort to the blunt beating, which this is. I think this is, Granicus has clearly been used by communities that are really struggling with enforcement and have limitations. Having Granicus involved makes a lot more sense once we do have Code restrictions about SDRs, but otherwise we're asking them to comply with things they're already complying with. From everything we can tell, and if someone can correct me if I'm wrong, I'd like to see what our STR owners are not complying with that's within our current regulations and restrictions. So I think the um, in the in that description of the uh, Granicus address identification system, it says that if you provide compliance records. That's what they check compliance for, but there is no compliance. There is no compliance requirement here because it's nothing to do with land use. The only thing in there is taxes, which is completely separate. And uh, because more platforms now are collecting plat are collecting taxes at source, um, the municipality doesn't have many of those records anyway. I mean, you can go to the municipality and it does have a list of everyone who has registered for um, room tax. And it says what type of operation they are, and where they are, and what their address is, and who the owners are. So that's all available publicly. Um, but uh, you said the compliance component is just not relevant. That's not relevant to this project. It's not a part of the service that's being asked for because there is no compliance requirement at the moment. I think, I mean, you, your point is right that if um, you, the, you'd get most use of these kinds of systems if there is um, a set of requirements for uh, SDRs to comply to, but there's a chicken and egg situation here. Of you can, we could create in principle, one could create a set of regulations which turn out not to work very well for the community because we don't know where short-term rentals are, we don't know if they're seasonal, we don't know if they're owner-occupied or not. Doing it this way gives us that information first so things can be um, more, so that any regulations that we do come up with can be 
a better tailor to the situation we have here. So, but you're right. I mean, ultimately, a lot of the services they provide outside of this contract would be um, future services potentially. But that's not part of this. This is just a data collection exercise. Granicus is producing a set of data which gives answers to these questions, a small amount of additional. Matthew. So may I ask a question about this page that says Gerdwood Short Term Rental Study? Yeah. I'm curious on um, where this came from. Well, this came from the a summary of the discussion, all the discussions and questions I could find, all my notes. So I wrote that. Okay, but this we don't we don't know that this accurately describes what the city is thinking of finding. Um, it accurately describes what the city has, when we have had discussions in the past with the city, it accurately describes the questions that have come up, okay. which includes the questions which have come up in the housing working group in um, in Imagine Girdwood and in other communities. I still don't see the piece of paper that says this is what the 12,000 is getting us. These are our community questions, but again, when I combed through this Granicus website, I didn't, they're not in the business of of answering these questions. No, they're in the business of providing a set of data, which um, is then easily translatable into those answers. I think that that's the piece of work we're planning. Maybe, to be doing. but I think that there are other companies. Again, Granicus is a code enforcement okay. company, not a social uh, research company. And, and we know, I mean, we even have local companies that could do this. I'm so, sure we could put, we could put out another contract to take that data and, and uh, answer the specific questions, but it's actually not a hard process. I'm going to go to the other no. questions which are out there. Unless okay. there's anyone else from the board who has a question. Lisa, I'm sorry. Well, that was actually my question. If if this isn't the perfect company, did you look at multiple companies? Do we have a list of maybe a better company that might it might look the way we want it to look? Um, social research companies don't have the source data. So you need the source data. That's what Granicus provides. And then getting those answers is a is honestly a trivial process that planning can do. I'm not suggesting that planning can only do trivial tasks. They can do complex tasks as well. I'm just saying that going from the source data to the questions is is simple. Sorry. Uh, Matt Checker. Uh, yeah. um, in terms of short term rental, I, to the extent that as a property owner, I have a short term rental person right behind me. And they're using their commercial property or their personal property for a commercial operation. To the extent that data is publicly available and accessible by incredibly powerful technology, we should have no issue with it. To the extent that it's responding. Because your operations or some sort of impact on my property. And so, and so again, as long as the data is held privately, you know, get it out. Assurances in a contract that can happen. You know, you know, we should have data to make good policies, not policies that then drive data. That's fine. Thank you. John? I don't understand why someone's running a commercial enterprise in a residential area, but the location is at home. It makes no sense to me that, that your address is not at home. I think the neighbor should know, and I think the neighbor should also know who's running that enterprise and who they contact if it's any kind of issue. I also find it odd that this concern about the violation of the bedroom, if you're raising to who knows who, who can do whatever they want those bedrooms. But, but all of a sudden, if somebody wants to look into this from the point of view of gathering data, it's a violation. And I think that's more of a stubborn stalling tactic to try to avoid dealing with a difficult issue that is hurting this community and has two sides. And uh, you want to respect short-term rentals, but you got to respect the whole package. And I, I hope you guys solve this problem and move forward because if you don't get data, that's a red flag. That, that's more than a red flag. That's just flat out with some struggling moving forward and trying to find a solution to something that virtually everyone agrees needs to be addressed in some ways. Thank you. Um, we have one question See, online. The guy was saying, well, why wouldn't you have the data public? Uh, because it's commercial you... and all commercial Hang on. data Hang on. is open. Uh, so that's kind of up. a good point. Like, can you, whoever's online, even can though you, it's can... your residence, but if you're running business minute, out of please. it now, you it's not. You're, you're all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brooks, you have your hand up. 
Um, yeah, thank you. I, I've got some uh, active dogs that might interrupt in the background, but uh, just quickly, um, the uh, I think this came through the land use committee. So, um, and, and whatever the vote was there, um, I think the board should have uh, very good and very clearly expressed reasons um, not to follow the outcome at land use. Um, and then secondly, I would note that um, there's operating principles. <clears throat> they were developed a long, long time ago, but one of the, the concepts and principles of uh, the land use committee, at least, is to make decisions based on good information. And this strikes me as a way to get um, decent information from which to make um, land use decisions in the future. Thank you. Uh, was there somebody else who wanted to speak online? If you could put your hand up, or if not, come off on come off mute and just speak. I think that was okay. Idea. That was just background talk. Crystal, I just have a question. If somebody, so I, I think that if this data was available to the public, I would have a humongous problem with it. Um, the fact that it only planning department will have access to it makes me feel better. But what? Where does it? If a member of the public calls the muni, the planning department, and says, I want to know about this address, is that something that they can share? What is on the Granicus information? I don't know. I mean, I think the you know, there's a there's a question about Freedom of Information Act, isn't there? So I guess there's you know, there's ways to get data, there's ways to get definitely all the data about um well, I mean for people who registered for room tax, it's available anyway, it's just on the website. Um, but yeah, I think it'd be that's a, an interesting question. Okay. There's no more questions or comments? I, I, I have one sure. comment. Um, Please. Go ahead, Guy, and then mm -hmm. Jennifer. So this is going to take a year to compile. And I know um, <clears throat> one thing we shouldn't lose sight of is we are going to get all this data. And depending on how you massage it and look at it, it could say one thing or another. So I think that, you know, as this matures and comes to, you know, when we finally get all our big data set, I think Land Use Committee and GBOS and everybody, we need to make it really good. Um, we need to really think of, of who's going to take that data. And, you know, you say it's relatively easy and we can spit something out, but um, we need to, um, we don't want to lose sight of that. And I think in the end, we need to make it a, a good decision on how that data is going to be used. and because it could say, depending on who's looking at it, it can, you know, mean one thing to somebody and something else to somebody else. So, well, again, I know, um, I don't know if Randy's uh, listening in and is able to say something, but I think Randy said at a recent um, committee meeting that he was working on short term rental regulation now. So, there may be something in play. I don't know. Are you, are you able to speak to that, Randy? Do you have a kind of time scale? Yeah. So so what I'm trying to do is just sort of scour other municipalities that have short term regulations in place and try to build um, kind of a compilation of what I think um, is acceptable and might be out there. And then I want to give it to GBOS and have you edit it, um, say what what fits your needs and what doesn't and work together towards something that I think we can propose to the assembly to help regulate short term rentals. Do you think this is a I mean, I'm hearing a lot from other communities within the municipality as well who have concerns. South Edition, for example, is this um, is this something you think would be a muni wide solution or a good with only solution? We're straying a little at, outside of this particular. Sorry, yeah, I'm looking at it as muni wide. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, Carolyn, you have your hand up. Um, yes, I was just reading the questions that you've included at the end of the study. And the one piece of data that's missing is the personal aspect of, I've been reading Granica studies from all across the US all week long. And most of them include a questionnaire for the owner of the property or the room or the half of the apartment. And they wanna know, questions about asking why are you renting and giving reasons 
whether it's financial or whatever. And that piece needs to be included in here because we are not data. We are people. We're not evil. We're part of the community and it would be nice to have a little bit of respect as people that contribute and are out there doing good things and whatever piece of information Granicus is giving you, they have the ability to ask questions on a personal level. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Jennifer. Yes, I, have um, I wonder I wonder if we could address some of the where items in the resolution of support. So uh, building off of Caroline's comments, um, I think when we look under the whereas and we have including, you know, the number of rooms and the price points and all of this, I think her points are a super important one because it's one that gets lost often when we're uh, talking about what other communities have done. My, my hunch, based on talking to people, and I don't know if it's true, is that Girdwood and uh, Anchorage are, are, are really entwined in this far more than some other resort communities that have struggled with this, that um, a lot of other uh, resort communities have people from outside the community, and you can argue about the Anchorage thing, but leaving that aside for a moment, <laughs> uh, out of state or in other municipalities, whereas we're really tied together. And a super important part of this is whether or not we've got any kind of big corporations coming in or people buying multiple properties, or these things are almost all private cabins being used. And I think that's one of the most critical questions because that if, if it turns out that these are private cabins that people are also using for part of the year, that affects this equation that I think has been oversimplified that there it, it, you can automatically clamp down on them and, and end up with term. So that I would I would ask if we could include that under this whereas number one, two, three, four, five, addressing Caroline's. Okay. So that would be that would be done through in a moment. We don't actually have a we do have a motion. And we have a second. So do you want to suggest a specific amendment? Yes. OK. I would like to suggest that in addition to these other questions that we're studying, that we also look into. Uh, how would we put this? That, that we look into uh, whether or not the STRs are also used for private purposes throughout. Mm -hmm. Right. Would that be covered under item three? The number of STRs associated with primary residence versus vacant housing? I don't think so. I think there's a third term that needs to go in there. Okay. Because Maybe that's a good way of doing it, just as a suggestion for language. Do you have a suggestion for changing that third point so it makes it does what you're suggesting? Um do you have a suggestion? What about versus part time occupancy? Yeah. Okay, let's, yeah, that's, yes, a good one. that's yeah. a good one. Okay, let's do yeah. I, I meant to that. <laughs> so the third point, the third bullet point would be something like number of STRs associated with primary residences, part-time occupancy versus vacant or vacant housing. Okay. Do we have a second for that amendment? I mean, I mean vacant. Well, do you, can you right. is that is that acceptable as a yes. wording? So we need a we need a second for that amendment. We need a second. I'll second the, the amendment as I understood what Jennifer just said. OK. Third bullet point. Comments on that. Let's see. I just I'm, the vacant housing thing is like a question to me because I, I kind of think it's a set. It should say primary residences versus um, full time STR versus part time occupancy because vacant housing is kind of like it's not being used. It's vacant versus like a full time STR, like that's the only reason why they own that property is to only short term rent it. So like that, like finding knowing the difference between who's living in the house full time versus who's renting it strictly as an STR versus who's occupying probably in the winter time and an STR in the summer. So that would be my suggestion is to remove vacant housing and put full time STRs. So part time short term rental, full time short term rental and primary residence. 
I think that's what I'm hearing. Yes. Okay. So that's friendly amendment. Thank you. Yes. So that would be the language. you just said. <laughs> okay. Margaret got that all second. That friendly <laughs> amendment. Thank you, Crystal and Jennifer. Okay. And you do have a question that's been up here. Oh, David. David, do you have a? Uh, yes, I just uh, wanted to say that it's my understanding when you were worried about FOIA that uh, FOIA won't give out information that may be prohibited by any other um, law. And uh, so if it comes under the Privacy Act, they would not disclose that information. Okay. I think we saw that when it came to um, how much room tax is coming from the resort or even how much room tax is, tax is not coming from the resort. That was, um, there was a question asked to the Muni and they would not release that information. Oh, that sounds like it's a similar thing. Thank you. Mm, uh, sorry about no video, but um, uh, it's not recognizing my camera. Thank you, David. Uh, Marco? Yes, I think during the land use committee, we discussed the need to understand um, the market saturation. Uh, and I'm not seeing Th that bit of information provided in this, uh, what I'm looking at here. Can you speak to that, Mike? Do you mean density? Well, you know, what we don't know is um, what demand there is, what additional demand there is for short-term rental beyond what's being provided now. So that if more subdivisions get developed, and there's no restrictions on short-term rentals in those subdivisions, how, how much of those will likely be converted over to short-term rental? And, or if there's no restriction on it and the market is already almost saturated, will the, most of those uh, houses be stay in long-term rentals? I'm not sure if that makes sense. And I think that was... Sorry, Mark, can I just respond to you? I think that's a very important question, but it's outside of the scope of the data collection. That's a that's a more detailed housing demand analysis, which is um, which is would have to use this kind of data, but would be a lot more involved. I mean, we we have that need for uh, housing demand analysis in the community in general, or housing needs analysis. I think is what it's called in the literature. Yeah. I and I think that was one of the drivers behind why I was supporting this in in the land use committee. Um, I'm not entirely sure what value no, taking a snapshot of the existing conditions are. It's many snapshots over the course of a year, but yes, I take your point. It doesn't answer the questions about future demand. Which, which is what we need to to be able to do uh, realistic planning with. Right. Okay. Um, Crystal, and then. So is, vac is vacancy not something that they can, um, like, so if there is a short term rental, but it's only rented 10 days of the 30 days of the month, then we would know kind of like that would kind of help with the saturation thing is the, is finding out like there, because I know that, I know that the. Oh, I see what you're saying. The tax reporting that you do with the Muni, you you say how many days the property is occupied or vacant. And so maybe that's something that Granicus can come back with because I in my personal opinion, I think that there is more STRs than there is business for STRs. And um, so it would be kind of interesting to know what the uh, vacancy of of the existing STRs might be. That's it. You know, just because there's 250 STRs, or let's say there's 400 STRs, if they're vacant most of the time, that's a pretty important thing to know, especially to dissuade people to buy one to do it. You mean if they're if they're listed as available, but there is not there's not there's not actual use, vacancy. yeah, not active, right? I got it. Thank you. Anything else? If not, we'll uh, we should we have the amendment in front of us uh, to change bullet point three. Um, have a roll call vote on that. Mike Edgington? Yes. Uh, Brianna Sullivan? Yes. Guy Wade? Yes. Jennifer Wingard? Yes. Uh, Amanda Sassy? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Okay, so now we're back to the, um, the original motion of the resolution as amended. Um, Jennifer? 
Go ahead. I have another, another quibble or two. Bear with me, guys. Bear with me. Uh, I think I think that we can can hopefully find some compromise on this. I, I would like to address the fourth whereas, and I'd like to propose that we just uh, strike that. Or we're going to have to like hash out this whole business about misunderstanding the long term rental market. But that's one where I feel pretty confident. It's already disclosed. I'm in the long term rental market in both Anchorage and Girdwood. And uh, I just, we've had multiple other, not multiple, but the other long term renters who have spoken up, the long term rental owners who have spoken up, uh, have, I, I think, addressed this. The economics are gone for long term rental properties. So I, I would like that we take this out, blaming it on STR. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but if we could just strike this, I don't view it as. Um, inherently valuable or necessary for this, whereas, and um, I view it as kind of falsely uh, blaming. Because anyway, as as anyone is welcome to run their own numbers, run your own numbers. I advise you to do that. It's online. You run what the property costs, and you run what you would have to charge for rent, and you will come up with uh, approximately eighteen hundred dollars per bedroom. And that it's not match anybody's understanding of the Google rental market. So I would just I would like to propose an amendment that would strike the fourth whereas. But this one right here. Yes. Okay, is there a second? I'm not hearing a second. So uh we're back to the motion as amended. Um, there's no more discussion. And there is. <laughs> Sorry. OK. Uh, it's one, two, three. Seventh, whereas. Two. I think that there is opposition for this study based on other things besides just uh, one, just privacy concerns, but also um, it's the Yes, uh, and concerned that this funding could be spent elsewhere. I understand that this is uh, addressing the concerns that were raised at the land use meeting. I think that there are other concerns about this. I would also like to ask that we consider striking this. And again, I don't think it's going to fundamentally change anything about this whatsoever. This, uh, the resolution of support will still be supported, and we don't have to declare what the opposition is and how. Valid it is. Okay. Uh, do I hear a second? Okay, I'm not hearing a second. So I think we're I think we're able to move on to uh, the vote for the resolution as amended. Okay. Uh, Mike Edgerton? Yes. Brianna, uh, Brianna Sullivan? Yes. Uh, Guy Wade? Yes. Jennifer Wingard? No. Amanda Sassy? Yes. Motion passes 4 1. Thank you. Um, we're now into the last item of old business, um, item number 16, or 10 and a half. Um, Goodwood Highway Interchange Review and Comment. Um, this was moved from new business to um, old business uh, at, when we amended our agenda. Um, I have received one piece of information from one who says she would be OK if uh, GBOS um, sends in a comment and um, a formal response at the end of the month. So we do have until the end of the month if we choose to uh, act. We can still we should still discuss it now. I just wanted to make everyone clear on that. So while we are discussing it now, we probably are not required to act now if we can act before the end of the month and we do have other meetings. Is it possible to bring up the um, uh, the plan? Please, Kyle. Yes. Thank you. So could you make that full screen? I think the important stuff is towards the south of the project as well. Yeah, let me see if I can get it up on the screen, but um, the link is not pointing to work. Sorry. It is available on the Seward Highway Interchange website. Okay. 
Okay, so um, nobody else has any initial comments. I've got some. What I've heard, I've heard actually a lot of comments from outside of the community as well as in, it, within Girdwood um, about the scale of this uh, project. And uh, it appears to be a very big project, a very large construction, and possibly, while well, many people would say completely out of scale with the, uh, with the problem it's trying to solve. Um, and I think the really the, the concerns are focused mostly on um, the size of the construction to the south of the island. I have my own personal feelings, but I'll let other people speak to this. I'll speak. Go ahead. This is Brianna. Thank you, Mike. And I also am glad to speak about this today before the next two meetings that we have. One is just with land use for one topic, and the next one is on the final day of August at noon. So coming up with a written comment if GBOS decides to uh, form a, a solid opinion about the proposed project uh, would be good to start with tonight. Uh, I was reading through a few comments that were sent and the main concern was again the magnitude of this and the comparison not so much of the price even though they thought price is pretty exorbitant that there were more fatalities to compare along the arm at McHugh or other turnouts um, from the Stewart Highway like Windy Point where people don't have time to stop coming around the corner, but here they have time to see what's coming and there is a slowing down before that. Um, and the amount of space that takes out toward the inlet. Uh, there's also lots of good feedback, but it's just, it's uh, a lot of overkill and massive and then keeps the traffic flowing without really slowing down much uh, as they come into our community, which we already have issues with speeding and keeping the, the calm. And then I'll wait because I have more comments I'm gonna read. Okay. Any other comments from supervisors? If not, we'll come back to you, Brianna. It is, I can't see whose hand that is. That's Michelle West. Oh, Michelle. Okay. So do you want to come back or I can ask Michelle first? Uh, I just, Yep, the, the other comment was comparing if Dowling and New Seward can handle a roundabout, why can't we handle a roundabout at that intersection or a simple overpass with a hard turn into Girdwood. And then we all received emails from people in public safety concerned about ambulances getting out of Girdwood at one egress. And um, there's a lot of good things too that people saw in it, but the personal one I had was bikes that maybe are biking on the highway and not on the bike path. There's not really a safe way to access. There isn't really a safe way to access the gas station right now, but um, I think that's all I have for now. Okay. Um, Chief Weston. Um, hello, um, my uh, comments are as follows. Um, I'm concerned that suddenly we're taking it from one from three alternate accesses to the community down to one. Um, right now, if there is a car accident there, which there has been at that um, intersection, um, but not a fatality car accident. There's been lots of car accidents there from people trying to turn uh, over the years. Um, but, uh, you know, we can reroute traffic uh, down Toadstool and then also through the sort of, uh, I don't know if it's Main Street or that road right before the gas station. So blocking all that off and putting it as one, only one road in and out um, doesn't seem to make sense to me. And we did talk to DOT about trying to gate uh, the gate Toadstool for emergency access but uh, that didn't seem to be reflective in the second time they came back. So concerned about that. Uh, concerned about uh, all the large sweeping um, on and off ramps and how people who might be tired from skiing or, you know, when it's Girdwood weather, uh, might uh, fall off them, off into the side. And then concerned about does DOT actually have enough, uh, I don't know, snow plow operators to actually plow all this because that's a lot more plowing for DOT. 
Um, and then as us, the people that are out there in the crazy weather when no one else is out there, um, we need to recognize that there are times when there is zero visibility due to um, due to snow falling or fog and that. And so I am concerned about how this would all play out. And then the final comment would be we do do a fair number of uh, patient transfers at the hospital at uh, at Tesoro or formerly known as Tesoro at the at the gas station there. And it's very easy for the ambulance right now to pull off and be there for us to do the patient transfer. Additionally, we have a large number of people who might have their emergency event uh, in turning and pass or on the highway, and they are desperately trying to get to Tesoro to have 911 meet them there. And so I'm concerned that it might, uh, blocking that all off and having them to go through a whole bunch of loops with their cars, I'm not sure quite how that's all going to be successful or not. Um, and the scale obviously seems uh, a bit massive. And then um, I, additionally, we still need to address the fact that DOT took out the rescue boat launch um, there. Uh, and so it's surprising that we're going to do all this, but not at least address the other glaring issue of the loss of the rescue boat launch with the other improvements. And then I'll take off my fire hat and just talk as uh, a Girdwood resident. So my comments as a Girdwood resident would be, I think, the scale and magnitude um, of taking away the wetlands and the birds there are, is uh, tragic. And I think that they could add maybe a board, I agree with the people that are suggesting for a boardwalk of some sort um, or something like that. And I think that, I don't think the magnitude of it really takes away a beautiful viewscape that goes into our community and it's gonna look kind of awful. Thank you. Thank you. Could I actually ask you a question? Um, Chief, the sure. I've heard a lot of um, I've definitely heard comments that there haven't been fatalities at that junction, so it shouldn't be treated as a priority. But um, in other discussions I've had about other aspects of the Seward Highway, it it seems like whether something has a serious whether something is a serious accident or a fatality often depends on um, you know a combination of luck and how fast uh, emergency responders get there. So. Would you say it's a dangerous, whether there have been fatalities or not, would you say it's a dangerous intersection now? I, I think it's, Jean, it's challenging. Okay, so as a first responder, it's challenging. You know, you go up to the end, approaching the intersection, lights and sirens, you've got to make that left-hand turn. That's challenging to get the left-hand turn with the traffic. And the uh my you know my big beef is with commercial vehicles that are going really fast through that area and um and even when there is a car accident at that location they go very fast through the car accident when police aren't there and we're still trying to get people out of the vehicles right so very lucky we haven't had a fatality now in terms of fatality i mean it all there's so many variables that go into how the car accident happens, right? So I, I can't say that that's a bad fatality zone or not, but I can say that there has been accidents there, but it's it's fixing what needs to be addressed, I think is fixing that left-hand term priority and however that may be, I think works. I don't, it's not compared to other locations that we frequently go for fatalities, it's not necessarily our number one spot. Thank you. Does that help? Thank you. Yes. Uh, Amanda, I see your hand is up. Thank you. Yes, um, I want to just echo some things that, yeah, the seems like a big impact and this is for coming from comments and also listening in and looking at it um, that maybe instead of a roundabout and I know I should can comment myself, but just to put it out there that the mirror lake um, on off ramp, not on the Mirror Lake side, but on the other side, it comes to like a T and that might be a good solution for like an overpass situation for us. Um, if that's possible, I don't know much about roads, but um, otherwise, yeah, I having Toadstool, I like the um, what Chief was saying, having the emergency access seems like a no brainer why they would take that out, maybe even taking the original alignment and making a frontage road or some kind for emergency access would be pretty clutch. Um, 
and otherwise it's a good start um but hopefully they take our comments seriously thank you thank you um is there another hand up i can't see you from no. the list okay thank you um so i guess the question is do we do we as a board want to uh, provide feedback officially what are we talking about a resolution? It would either be a resolution or a, or a letter, whatever we decide to do, but we do not have to act on it tonight. We can just make the decision to um, put something together and then make it to make an actual have an actual vote at a later meeting before the end of the month. We have at least two options. I have one thing, Mike, really quick. Uh, do you want to go and then two, two thoughts. One was uh, the other one would be we all can write as independent people. Yes, we could do that anyway. And then, right. And then um, one of the feedback letters we got said that GBOS supported this project, but if you read it carefully years ago, not all of us were on the board, wrote a resolution to address this, this intersection. So that is what was supported. Not this one, which was not one of the 12 proposed 18 months ago or however many months ago, there were so many options with lots of lights and lots of different things, but I don't remember this option as seen one of them. That's correct. This was not one of the options uh, presented in the initial 12. Uh, yes, the 2018 resolution was to um, take some of the funding which was available in the, um, in the, the whole um, work going from uh, Ingram Creek to uh, Girdwood and use it to come up with a design for this. So that was a resolution to spend funding to develop a design. This is the output of that process. So we we definitely haven't made any statement on this for the initial 12 um, designs that were proposed last year. I'm sorry, Jennifer. Um, I'm just going to echo what has already been said by Brianna and Amanda that I've heard a fair amount of uh, negative feedback about this. And I, I think given that both roads and public safety are under our view that it's good to reflect it, the community view, but it's best we can. And I think it's also more powerful if it comes from board of board supervisors than all of us as individuals. So I would be comfortable with uh, resolution posing this or asking for other options. I was going to. Um... I'm pleased you said that because I was going to wonder if uh, roads, if the road supervisor and uh, public safety supervisor could perhaps get together and put together a draft that we yeah. can then discuss at a later meeting. And Matt, you have a question. Yeah, uh, more of a comment. Yeah. Um, to me, it seems like the, uh, the solution in search of a problem and the idea that you can use something like this as a community as a community. Obviously, the Oftentimes, it's not the straightaways are the problem, it's the roundabouts and the turnabouts that you can't see. And I think you're thinking about Galloway, or they turn into sheets of ice in the winter. I've done making a straight up turn that I do. I've done every day for years, as opposed to trying to navigate roundabout. I think you create a situation of more problems for Girdwood residents with that, with that roundabout entrance than what you do. So, when you, when you say roundabout, that, do you mean well, the, the turn? The, 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 the big loop on the south yeah. side. The, I think they called a trumpet yeah. intersection. Number four would be. Do you mean the roundabout itself, the small roundabout? Either one. The roundabout, okay. any Got of the it. turns. Got it. Any of the turns. It's just, it's going to get into the element of four elements, right? Yeah. But, Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Kyle. Uh, so we've had a meeting with DOT about this uh, design. Um, and they particularly had to do with maintenance. Uh, they wanted the service area to take over the frontage road there in front of the Tercero, uh, which we rejected. Um, uh, but uh, this design was a result of the meetings that the design team had with the residents in Old Town, because uh, the previous six versions really had a, a strong effect on Old Town. They were going to try to uh, upgrade Maine and Gold to help flow traffic around that area down there which would just bring in a ton of more traffic to it. And so Old Town was trying to find protection um, with the upgrade of this intersection um, there. And uh, and so I think that's how we got to this alternative was the direct feedback from the residents of Old Town down there. Um, 
One thing that it does do on a positive note is that it does give a dedicated access to gold instead of having to try to go through the Tesoro parking lot. Anytime you go to Old Town on a Saturday in the summer, trying to get through there into your residence back there is is a hairy situation. So that that was a positive in that aspect. And then it also sort of limited the access into the Stewart Station Mall as right now you can just basically fall off the highway into the mall right now. Um, and, and people come from all different directions. I know I personally, when I come down there and the line is back up past the mall, uh, I'll turn into the Gerwood Fire Station or the Gerwood uh, Station Mall and then go out there on Main Street to take a left. It's trying to take a left at the intersection as people are trying to take a left to come into Gerwood and trying to get out there. It's Russian roulette trying to get out onto the road, you know, so I'm surprised we don't have more accidents the way it is there in that aspect. Um, but it will be a challenge uh, for the DOT to maintain this. I mean, you just drive out right now, you see DOT is in the most desperate situation I've ever seen them. They have a banner out in the highway recruiting drivers. Um, that used to be a very coveted job here in Gerwood, be a driver for DOT because of the benefits and the pay. Um, but as like everything else we're seeing, they're having a hard time finding operators. So, um, so yeah, it will be very much a challenge. And if, you know, the other aspect about it is where they're going to find the gravel for all this. That's the huge question right now. Um, you know, the Forest Service hasn't opened up more land down there in Portage. Uh, they're hauling gravel in from Whittier and, and turning in paths for the projects down on the bottom of Portage right now. Um, so that, that will be a, a huge thing as to how they bring in the gravel. Um, and then one other positive is that it does replace the bridge crossing over, which is a vital link to us. It replaces the bridge with a new bridge a very old bridge down there and the pedestrian bridge that does cross it is the same build as to what collapsed in Anchorage with those glue lambs and then they're tied into the um, the five by five posts that make the, the base there for that bridge. And that bridge also would become uh, railroad approved and then we could connect the Diderot uh, trail to uh, the bird to gird. We can't do that right now because the bridge that cross does not comply with the railroad crossing. So, so those those facts would, have, would change with this project. So, so there's some points that we learned through the process of working with DOT on this. Thank you, Kyle. When you talk about the bridge, you mean the bridge over the railroad? Correct. The new proposed bridge that they show, yes. the one there, they would replace, they replace the current bridge. And then they propose a second bridge, which would cross the Seward Highway and uh, provide a, you know, a, in this design, provide then a curve and a loop. Correct. Um, it would be a more of a flow. Time. There would be no stop. You'll yeah. flow onto the highway. Yes. Southbound traffic. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, um, all of the first setting alternatives use the exit. So the 12 we talked about earlier that presented last year use the existing alignment of um, Alaska Highway. So they were very close to Old Girdwood, very close to uh, the Girdwood Station, uh, Station Mall. And uh, this one of the changes in this design is to obviously use a different alignment, which means a new bridge over the railroad and takes traffic away from um, Old Girdwood and provides this possibility of separating access to the mall. But that, that is distinct from, I think, the decisions they've made on the trumpet interchange on the south. Okay, so I think, I don't know if we have to vote, but uh, I think we've probably come to a consensus that uh, we will, um, that the roads and public safety supervisors will draft a, um, a resolution and uh, we will discuss that at our, either our LUC meeting or probably the budget meeting, I would imagine. Um, but we will discuss the scheduling. Uh, we'll, we'll get an email from uh, Margaret to suggest when we schedule that before the end of the month. The budget okay. meeting just one day before the end of the month. Yes. Yeah. I wonder if we could add it on to that. I hate to add something on to the LUC. It's pretty important. Yeah. I think we, we can have that discussion offline. Yeah, just to offer, I think that it might be nice to get more comments from yes. the yeah. police committee. Um, yeah. I think that there are probably some other great ideas out there on things that might be included, whether it is a resolution or a letter, might be I think, a good letter. Okay, yeah, yeah, you're probably right. It's probably better as a letter. There and there. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we've made a decision without necessarily voting. So, unless there's any disagreement. No, just one point of clarification. Uh, so, as I understand, the way we normally do resolutions, excuse me, are supposed to be positive, not negative. So, we're not supposed to make a resolution against 
this. I think this suggestion was a letter. The letter. <laughs> if we did it as a letter, right, I'm getting right. yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Well, I guess what I'm thinking what? about this is that you, you may be against this, but you want to present some ideas yes. that will be considered. Okay. And so I think if they read a letter of objection that might not inspire the continued thought on let's read these points and see what Gerd would think. It's probably just a letter rather than letter of objection. Just a a letter, letter which has, you know, our, both our concerns, things we like, and okay. everything else. Maybe right. photos. He's received a couple. Yeah. You can send a Snapchat. Yeah. <laughs> Do whatever you okay. want. Hey, we will move on to old business. Oh, sorry, new business. Agenda item 11, uh, LUC 2208-05, request for GBOS letter of non-objection, case 2022-0080, amendment to special land use permit for alcohol um, beverage dispensary tourism duplicate for the Pond Cafe and Boartide Deli. We have a lot of information in our packet on this. And we will, this is an introduction, but we will try to have, see if we can get somebody from the resort to come and speak about it. But it just sounds like they're doing a rearrangement of their alcohol license on premises. Okay. And uh, have to go through the process of uh, getting an application completed. Right. Because there is an applicant, they are currently permitted on that. So it's, this is just a change in. Yeah, they're doing, a, I know they're do, redoing the pond and things like yeah. that. Okay, any questions, comments? Not seeing any, we'll move on to item number 12, agenda item LUC 2208-06, initial presentation of uh, Girdwood, land, commu Girdwood Community Land Trust. It says Girdwood Land Community Trust. Girdwood Community Land Trust requests for GBOS resolution of support. Um, and information is available on the packet. Hi, everyone. This is Crystal Hoke. Uh, can you click on that active link by chance in the agenda? That one? Yep. Okay, so I am. Um, oops, that's my page there. Um, okay, so. This is currently on our website for anybody to refer back to. There's that active link on the agenda that will go to this page. Um, Heritage Land Bank has offered Girdwood Community Land Trust an opportunity for a 55 year ground lease on Girdwood South Town Site, Track G6. Uh, we've been provided with an example of a lease for a nonprofit, which is the Chugach Volunteer Fire Department ground lease. And it's a 55 year lease. Um, also, and we are still in the beginning phases of working through the details on the lease and conditions that would be needed to move forward. In order for us to move forward, the land tra um, transferring from a lease into ownership is required for a CLT model to work. So I'm hoping that there can be a clause in the lease that uh, allows the opportunity for ownership as opposed to leasing. Um, this lease is the first step towards local land management intended for community use. Also needed would be the ability to sublease to other local nonprofits right away. Um, a purpose of this presentation is to increase transparency and notify the community this opportunity has been recently offered. Uh, we hope to collect public comments. A form is available on our website listed on the agenda, which is down below on this web page. Um, we'll be updating the page with further details regarding how we visualize, envision utilizing the land as we receive new information. We welcome you to visit our website and encourage you to read more and become a member or learn about the lease as we progress in the process. Um, can you scroll down just a little bit? Our bylaws state that our um, board elections happen in the first fourth quarter of each year. We traditionally do this in October. So if you are a professional who's interested in joining our board, we would love to have you um, come join us. We invite those who are interested in volunteering in any minor capacity as well as new board members. Um, so this South Town site is uh, back by the ball field and it has, uh, in my opinion, the most amount of community planning done on it than any other parcel in Girdwood, which is why I think it's really important that we move it into uh, local management. And if you could scroll down to the next screen there, um, that identifies the parcel. It's a 12 and a half acre parcel. And scroll down. This is the environmental um, map that is shown in the Girdwood South Town site uh, master plan. So there's already a master plan completed for this parcel, which is very helpful. 
Um, scroll down one more. This uh, describes the zoning and it is it's basically a mixed use. Uh, you can do commercial and residential on it. Scroll down a little further. These are snapshots that were taken from the 2022 HLB work plan, uh, but we have been updated that it, they are not going to move forward on that plan. Um, but this is marked for disposal and on this little um, grid and then also on the map in the next screen there. And um, scroll down one more. Um, so I just met with uh, Little Bears um, at five o'clock tonight, and we uh, first we celebrated the funds that came in from ARPA, which is super exciting. And um, one of the things that we would like to move forward on is uh, possibly developing the new childcare facility in that location. And so if you scroll down a little bit further, you can see um, some work that's been done by Z Architects. Uh, and we took the uh, previous design plans and dropped it into the um, Southtown site. And the outline in red is the developable area uh, that's outside of any flood constraints, uh, both 100 year flood floodplains and 500 year floodplains. And so this would take roughly two acres of that parcel, uh, maybe two and a half, and the rest of it could be used in our in our vision would be uh, workforce housing and a future recreation center would be the long term goals. But this would be the uh, child care center would be the short term goals. Um, we do have some other opportunities um, on Alieska land, but are currently um, sorting through. Uh, first of all, this this probably is not possible at this site unless we get a variance regarding the road. The way that it's written right now, we'd have to spend about five million dollars to build the public road in two different spots. And obviously that's Little Bears is not going to be able to accomplish that. So we are hoping to get um, some kind of special uh, variance so that we can only develop to uh, what we are proposing utilizing of that parcel. So roughly covering the road to where the two acres um, stops and uh, and so we appear to have Adam Trombley's support in uh, getting that kind of um, arrangement done and but if that's not possible then this location is probably thrown out altogether so the point is is that we are moving forward on um, any multiple locations to figure out where we can get the best bang for our buck and money spent uh, for building the facility uh, but at this moment in time, this is where um, staff is, is most in support for Little Bears. Little Bear staff is most in support of South Town site and um, Little Bears board has voted to um, continue pursuing this as an option. So uh, theoretically, we would uh, enter the CLT into this 55 year lease agreement and uh, sublease it to Little Bears immediately. Uh, a, a sublease the two two and a half acre parcel to uh, Little Bears. So because I think that's the fastest route uh, to accomplish it. Um, but again, if we move it into ownership, which we would like to, Little Bears can own the own land that they are um, on top of as well. So and then just below is the kind of comment period. So if you do have um, specific comments, um, you can mark if you're in favor of us pursuing this lease and then if you have any additional comments. And uh, it's at girdwoodlandtrust.org. And then it's under the um, things that inspire tab. And then you click on the uh, August uh, 22 update. And then you should see this web page that we just showed here. So any comments or questions? Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Let's go ahead. Comment. Thanks, Crystal. Um, pretty exciting. The local workforce housing, you said that you know, you're hoping that you can take this lease and turn it into ownership. Would that include the local workforce housing or would that be like a complex of, of like long term rental type? Ideally, it would be both. It would be a combination of some that are strictly rentals and some that are um, own, um, even rent to own or straight up ownership. But under a CLT model, the CLT owns the land below it and the um, owner owns the structure, the house itself. And so it works very similar, uh, extremely similar to a condo association where the condo association owns the ground 
And in like the case of the birdhouses, individual owners own those birdhouses separately. So the uh, CLT model works basically just like that. And what makes it affordable, CLT owns that ground and they don't have to pay that $150,000 for a quarter acre foot. Plus we would like to explore alternative building options that are available too. And there are ways to make things more affordable too. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I know that like tiny houses might not be allowed right now per code, but I think that there are reasons to discuss maybe changing that um, to get the kind of price points that we need. And that's kind of our main goal is trying to shoot for these particular price points that are like $800 to $1,000 for one bedroom, $1,400 for a two bedroom, $1,800 for a three bedroom. Um, because I don't, I mean, like has been discussed many times, affordable is just, is uh, defined differently depending on who you're talking to. But uh, those are the price points that I have talked to renters in the community um, and that seems realistic. And so we are going to try to match the development with those price points. And uh, so that's the goal, but yeah, that's a future plan. Like right now it would be strictly moving forward on the child care facility as our phase one and then um, workforce housing as a future phase two, phase three in um, the rec center. And just speaking as an educator, why this is so cool, you know, when I, I thought it was neat, you know, seeing, you know, Alyeska offering land to little bears, but, you know, if you're going to you go, you're that far away from everything, that's, that just completely changes your program. Could you just, sure. could you just identify yourself with the right? Thank you. Um, but yeah, you know, being down here, gives the kids an opportunity to still be able to walk to the library and the park and all the wonderful things that make Little Bears so special. So this is really exciting. So I do have a question about the, and you touched on this earlier. So um, CLT model is based on owning of the land and obviously what HLV are offering is lease. So what's the sort of, how quickly would you need to move it into um, land ownership to sort of do the things you'd like to do beyond. Oh, yeah, I would like to include a clause in the lease where we either have first right of refusal or first right of sale in the first 10 years. So I, I was hoping for five years. You suggested 10 years. I'm happy to take that suggestion. Uh, and hopefully we can do it much sooner than that. Uh, but um, including that as kind of like, this isn't going to really help us without Right. eventual ownership uh, being clear uh, from the beginning. So in terms of uh, potential workforce housing, that's the kind of time scale you're talking about. It would be after you own land. Yeah, but if if we have a, um, I mean, the thing is, is that we could probably apply for grants if we have a lease, because then we can identify that we have an right. interest in the land. And so then if we get some kind of grant, which then we can say, hey, we're ready to execute on our first right of uh, refusal. Um, in that 10 year period, it might move much, you know, in a year or two or something like that. But a lease could be executed very quickly. Um, it needs to get approved by HLBAC and also the assembly. But assuming that that occurs, we can move into a, a lease in maybe three months, depending on how fast uh, HLB is willing to take it through the process. Okay. Thanks. I've got some other questions, but I'll wait until next time. One quick follow-up on that. Um, I would assume that HLB would ask for fair market value for that, right? So to, to roll right into ownership would just be like purchasing so, a chunk of land. You know, how would you? So specifically in the code, in HLB's code, uh, HLB can dispose to nonprofits for less than fair market value. It's very clearly identified. Uh, but that what Adam is not really sure about, Mr. Traveler is not really sure about, is uh, how much below market value. Right. So that was kind of the reason why we had turned in our application in December of 2020 is because we needed to know what what price are we going to have to pay for the land, and and then we do our business plan according to you know that information. So um, that's yet to be determined. There is an appraisal that came back on this property. Um, but it's a uh, that would be forthcoming, you know. It, getting in, getting it secured by the lease would be the first stepping stone and an important one. This is a big, huge step for um, 
organizing carts and horses. Yes. <laughs> But we want to not do any. I mean, I'm expecting others to go through the land use and GBOS process, which is why I put it on the agenda. Yeah, the the, the HL, as just to extend slightly what Chris said, the um, the HLB thing is that it can go to nonprofits. It can also, if it's in the community's interest, it can be for less than fair market value. So <laughs> it's important to sort of outline what the community's interest is and to make sure it's all aligned. Which I don't think will be a hard thing. I was just curious. I thought when the Forest Service on HLB land, and then they had to purchase that lease for fair market value. But I guess that's not a nonprofit. So. Yeah, they're not a nonprofit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any more questions or comments? Hearing any, we will move on to item number thirteen: uh, staff request for approval of funding for media equipment for the Godwood Community Room. Uh, Parks and Rex 406. Can we cover um, items 13 and 14 together? Please? Yes, if the body agrees. All right, into that one. Because we're not acting on it, so we don't vote separate. Um, so, as I try to get information uh, pulled up here, I'm going to get through this liquor license. It's crazy. That's page 97, I think. Yeah, it's all in this thing. It's crazy. Okay, so um, our media in this room, uh, especially the visual, has reached its end of life. It's 15 years old. Um, it has lasted a long time, um, but has gotten to a point where it needs to be upgraded and changed out. Um, as you can see in our wall plugs, we still use VGA connections and everything now is HDMI. Um, and our projector, um, is still a dual lamp projector, and now they're all sort of laser um, focused ones. This one has a lamp life or a, a lifespan of 12,000 hours, and now the ones come out are 30,000 hours. Um, so what we're requesting is an upgrade of the system here. Um, even this uh, projector uh, screen to be replaced because it's disintegrating, and when we drop it down, it sticks, um, and we have to actually kind of hand pull it down, um, and it's starting to go out. And so in total, we're looking at close to an expense of about $20,000. Um, and that is all directly tied to the um, equipment itself uh, using Extron uh, controllers. Uh, the um, the uh, projector itself is $7,500, but then we put in a special long throw lens, um, which will be amazingly bright. Um, compared to this and more accurate so that we can run with any type of light scenario in here. Um, and that's $2,100 uh, to go in there. Um, and then they all come with their own unique mounts and things along those lines, plus the labor to rewire the room. So they would rewire all these outlets. We could still use this control panel. Um, and with that, you can set up your whole thing from this control panel, but they would replace all the ones with the new HDMI connections. Um, and get the system set up um, so that it could be plug and play. And then it would also have uh, Bluetooth connections. So you can cast from computers, from your phone, probably from your watch, um, and, and use it without having to plug in. So it would make just a more of a seamless effort um, and less wires all over the ground and setting things up. We have a workout group that comes here in the morning and every time there's some conflict, since this, this one has died, we're using this and then they're using the TV and we need to get back to a system that we can just plug in and they can go like they used to before. So, so we've crossed that road, but we put a savings aside in our capital account for the room, um, which we used to buy this equipment with and uh, we would use for purchasing this as well uh, going forward. So that's what we're looking at for this room here. So I'll open up any questions. Any questions? I'm not seeing any questions and we'll obviously uh, discuss this again next month and uh, we can act on it next month. Thank you. Um, so we covered items 13 and 14. Um, item 15, discuss ideas for DOT community transportation program, alternative transportation program and reconnecting communities pilot uh, discretionary grant program. So Amanda is going to take this. Yes, thank you. 
Um, the it's actually sorry, transportation alternative program tap. Um, and thank you, Margaret, so much for um, putting that information into the packet. Um, super helpful. This would be probably, especially the um, the C CTP would be something that maybe um, Kyle, Margaret, um, and the GBOS would want to talk about um, about what might like this might be able to fund the Vale uh, Timberline T paving. Um, one of the things that um, it describes it being good for. Oh, gosh, I scrolled too far. Oh, here we go. Um, examples, improve existing surface transportation facilities, improve existing or construct new transportation facilities such as roads, intersections, roadway safety improvements, transit, et cetera. Um, so uh, just things that are we, we should keep on in mind. It'd be sad to see us not at least put something down um, as a request. Uh, and then the transportation alternative um, being trails to connect um, to services, I think. But also it's saying uh, scenic overlooks and viewing areas. Um, so uh, that would be the transport alternative program would be something that would need to go through the trails committee and land use probably um, as Margaret pointed out. So it, I'm stoked to see that the um, initial is actually the deadline for phase one, just the like interest, um, which is a shorter uh, document is due the end of October. I When I first saw October, I thought it was the beginning of October. So um, that gives us enough time to go through those processes with the other um, committees that are needed to go through. So, um, and then the last one, the DOT um, funding, I, it was all part of what um, Mark, the DOT rep, had mentioned uh, in a follow up email after the last GBOS meeting. And that one doesn't really pertain to anything that we're doing with GBOS. It was, I didn't realize that at the time, it was actually more for um, Imagine Girdwood because it is potentially good for planning and we have trouble finding planning money so um but we're now funded uh for a lot of what imagine gird was doing so that's irrelevant here um but does anyone have any questions or suggestions for um either the community transportation program or the transportation alternative program kyle i think has about 20 things to list <laughs> i know i know we're gonna have to have a talk about it I, I think I think the, the, the one you get on there, if we can get funding for the Timberline, Vail to Loveland project um, would be ideal. That'd be great. And the other one I think that is a high priority is the bike path down Ruane all the way to the hotel um, to have that redone. Um, it, it, it has a poor foundation. It needs a new foundation, it needs a new asphalt. And um, and so I think that I think we tried to follow that uh, a few years ago um and didn't have success but i think it's worthy to go back and chase that again because that's that's a main connector and a safe connector through town sorry uh, when you said the bike path from you mean from the alberg t the alberg t all the way to the hotel and yeah. yeah yeah thank you awesome thank you for that suggestion and um the only other uh thought that i had was um what crow creek might need um which is probably a lot but um that's something else i'm i'm thinking about with these programs correct and then and it maybe that's where we work with dot to put in a request for for that um you know i think we also have a lesson learned there we did secure almost seven hundred thousand dollars for the crow creek neighborhood which is the municipal right away section up there and they ended up rejecting that money, which was a real shame because it could have helped them a lot with improving their section of road, their drainage and all that. Uh, they didn't want the improvements, even though a community member up there petitioned for it. So, so we want to make sure if we're doing anything within that section right away that they're supporting it. 
Um, question, maybe you can speak to this, but would a pl uh, some planning money uh, be good? Or do you think that there's actual projects that could um, be shovel ready? Because that DOT community transportation program or re reconnecting communities pilot, I can't remember which one it is, sorry, but um, the, the other one, um, could be something, but that's due October, the beginning of October, and there's not a scoping period for that third one that I didn't really talk about. I think planning probably would be better because I don't think they have any plan about Go Creek and how to address any improvements there. So they probably would need a planning process. I think the reconnecting communities is um, is about where there's something in the community that some piece of transportation infrastructure that's splitting the community. And the only thing we really have is the railroad. Yes. So it's potentially, um, Potentially anything to provide connectivity across the railroad yes, uh, might be helpful, although that's kind of complicated because we now have this other intersection plan in place. And we already have a bridge that does connect them, so it would be improving that bridge, I guess, would be improving that bridge or providing other connections across sure. it. Yeah. yeah, or even yeah. other footpaths across the railroad. Gotcha. To connect to the old Girdwood? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, good discussions and um, we'll be yeah looking at talking about these in future uh, meetings with more information. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, if there's no other comments. We'll move on to item 17. Uh, training options for GBOS and committees. I think Jennifer's name is here. Um, I can actually start by the we um, we have a open uh, request for the um, for legal to provide training for Open Meetings Act and uh, ethics rules, ethics code, and uh, that was being discussed at the Board of Ethics meeting, and it's been postponed twice, I believe, this Board of Ethics meeting this Wednesday, uh, where that should be on the agenda. Hopefully we'll get a decision there. So it's not necessarily terminally stalled? No. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, to talk about the possibility of doing a parliamentary procedure training as well as the reason why is because we've gotten not a fair amount of community feedback arguing about various things, but also because I think of the what we're about to go into with Holton Hills and uh, possibly more situations where the GBLS might not necessarily agree. I would just like to see us be on the same page about exactly how we're doing things. So that'd be what I have to say about that. Um, I guess I'd like to know if the board is generally interested. Eric? Yeah. I think so. Um, reports are in the packet. Uh, anything else of good of the order? If not, we will oh, move to adjournment. I could just add for the library report, Martin, Martina, right? Her last day is coming up. Sure to say oh, hi, goodbye right. to Martina. Okay. Oh, and Jamie, I don't know if we didn't mention that, but Jamie left. And so Amber is the acting director, uh, director of the library right now, or the manager of the library, and they're looking for a new manager. Okay. Advertising this. We do have a uh, few hands popping up here. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, Lene is the first one. Can you, Lene, please go ahead. Yep. Hey, I missed the first 20 minutes of the meeting, so apologies if this was already mentioned, but I was wondering, has a date been selected for the combined GBOS LUC where they were going to um, discuss different items, but in particular, the letter of resolution by the chamber? Yeah, yes, it's actually so. on the agenda. The GBOS LUC joint meeting is scheduled now for Tuesday, August 30th at 7 o'clock via team. Thank you. Brooks. Hey, thank you. Um, this follows up on uh, what Kyle was saying about the library. It's something I wanted to bring to the community's attention, and it's something I just recently learned uh, today, as a matter of fact. Um, apparently, the uh, current plan to uh, replace the um, librarian is to downgrade the position um, within the municipal system, thereby lowering, lowering the uh, minimum qualifications, professional standards, educational background, etc. cetera. Um, the, um, you know, I'm a member of the uh, Library and Community Room Boosters organization, which has existed since the library opened in 2008. And 
we are sort of going to be <clears throat> following up on this a particular issue. It's a matter of concern uh, for me because I feel the library has had enough um, uh, enough uh, exposure to questions about the commitment um, of the municipality to the library mission as a whole and the value it places on libraries. And to me, this is just one more reflection of uh, an attitude that diminishes the importance of libraries um, to our community. So uh, the boosters will, uh, I guess, try to keep you posted. I, I, I don't know if this is anything that the board would want to get uh, involved in but you know our position is going to be that the position should not be downgraded that the community has benefited from applying the same standards in girdwood that are applied to all other branches in anchorage and uh, that our community shouldn't be um, sort of a stepchild in terms of the qualifications of the branch librarian Thank you, Brooks. Do you know if that's um, if the proposal is just to do that only for, or to do it only for the Girdwood branch or for all branches? Well, we're the branch that has a vacancy. OK, so, got it. Well, yeah. Whether it's a, a plan, you know, I, I'm not going to try to predict that. OK, thank you. Thank you for letting us know. Um, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Yeah. And I'm going to assume that's going to be seconded, seconded by Guy. No objection. Thank you very much, everybody. Just under the wire. Thank you. Thank you.